Chapter 2611 Imogen got out of the car while Shirley went to park. Quickly, Imogen entered the premises and rummaged through the wine cellar. Eventually, she found a laptop bag under the cellar and unzipped it. There was a laptop inside, and she heaved a sigh of relief. She looked outside the window, noticing that Shirley was coming over. She swiftly stepped onto the counter and hid the laptop in a hidden compartment above. When she leapt back down, Shirley had just entered the store. I've searched everywhere, Shirley, but there's no laptop in sight. You must have gotten it wrong. Shirley frowned. That can't be right. I did hear them saying they left a laptop here. We should keep looking. Shirley started looking around, and Imogen played along. About 15 minutes later, Shirley said, well, perhaps I've been mistaken. You bumped your head, after all. Maybe you heard it wrong, said Imogen. Shirley agreed, saying, you're right. That could be the case. I'm sorry for wasting your time. Imogen patted Shirley's shoulder. It's fine. Let's go back to the hotel. Shirley nodded and left with Imogen. Halfway on their way back, Imogen said, Shirley, I want to get some presents for my friends before we head back. Go on without me. Shirley knew what Imogen was going to do, so she said, I'll be on my way, then. I might even have to stop by a police station and have my testimony taken. Imogen got out of the car and saw it off. Once Shirley was out of sight, she went into a gift shop and perfunctorily picked some presents. Five minutes later, she came out of the shop and got a cab to the store earlier. As soon as she arrived, Imogen got a chair, stood on it, and took the laptop bag down. She left the shop, but just as she was about to get away, four cars surrounded her, and several plain clothes officers came out of them. They'd been staking the place out. Freeze. Hands where I can see them. Shocked, Imogen said, this is a mistake. I was just grabbing something for a friend. The cops had gotten their orders to capture Imogen, not allowing her to explain herself. They cuffed her and took her into the car. Meanwhile, Shirley hadn't gone that far. She saw Roy standing by the roadside solemnly with a few cars around him. Shirley got into one of the cars and saw Zacharias, whom she had told not to come, reviewing the store surveillance footage. Imogen has been captured. Your plan worked. Perfectly. Zacharias praised her. Shirley had remained calm after finding out what the situation was, and that itself was worth praising. We'll meet her at the police station next. I want to know why she did this. Shirley still felt agonized. She couldn't accept this betrayal. Sure. We'll swing by the police station right now. We found another phone in Imogen's room. She has deleted the text messages, but we're getting someone to recover them. We'll retrieve her call history, too, said Zacharias. Now, they had enough evidence to prove that Imogen was involved in the kidnapping. Meanwhile, Imogen was in the police car, panicking. She could only think of one person who could help her Shirley, the one who trusted her wholeheartedly. She knew that Shirley, being her best friend, would defend her right away and clear her name. You've got the wrong person. I'm Zoravia's vice president's bodyguard. I need to call my team now, said Imogen, panicking. We'll talk when we're back at the police station. I don't care who you are, but we have the power to arrest anyone suspected to be a criminal. I need to make a phone call. Imogen argued. The police station was within sight. Imogen was eventually locked in a room, awaiting interrogation. She pleaded to make a call several times, but her requests were denied. She panicked as she paced around. Soon, Shirley and Roy arrived. The number Imogen called belonged to the ringleader of the kidnappers, and the cops were trying to recover the deleted text messages. They'll recover the messages in ten minutes. We just have to wait, said Roy. We have time. It's not like she can run away, answered Shirley. The friendship she shared with Imogen was already lost. After she saw how conniving Imogen was, she knew there was no friendship between them all along, she was only using Shirley to her advantage. Ten minutes later, the lost messages were recovered. Shirley, through the messages, saw how Imogen exposed her true identity. She was also the one who came up with the abduction plan. The proof of betrayal sitting right before her suffocated Shirley for moments. She held up the paper and asked the cops to let her meet Imogen. The cops knew who Shirley was, so they promptly brought her to where Imogen was locked up. 
Imogen was in a rut, but when she heard someone coming, she quickly held the steel bars and tried to see who it might be. To her delight, it was Shirley. Shirley, Shirley you're finally here, I thought you wouldn't come. Imogen heaved a sigh of relief, thinking Shirley had come to save her. However, she noticed that Shirley wasn't smiling. She was cold and indifferent. Imogen pleaded, Shirley, you have to prove that I'm innocent and tell them to release me. Shirley turned to the cop. Give us ten minutes, please. Thank you. The cops left. Once they were gone, Shirley turned back to the steel bars, looking at the panicked Imogen while staring into her eyes. Imogen, why did you tell the kidnappers everything about me? When did you start working with them? Horrified, Imogen stared at Shirley in disbelief. She played dumb. What are you talking about, Shirley? I don't get it. Stop playing dumb. See for yourself. Shirley hurled the paper into the cell. Imogen bent down and picked them up. When she saw the text history, she froze. It was her chat with the kidnappers. Listen to me, Shirley. They made me do this. They were desperate for money, so they came to me. They know you and Mr. Flintstone share a deep bond, so they made me tell them everything. Imogen's eyes were getting red. She was trying to regain Shirley's trust. Stop explaining yourself. I know full well what kind of person you are. Even back at the base, you only approached me because I was from a good family. You never saw me as a friend, only something you could use. Imogen froze. She didn't think Shirley had seen through her true colors. No, wait. You were my best friend. Imogen was still trying to regain Shirley's trust. Also, you sold me out to the kidnappers for money. You risked my life. You handed me on a platter to them. Shirley's eyes flared with rage. Since she couldn't regain Shirley's trust, Imogen sneered. When did you realize it, Shirley? Your operation was sloppy. It took me five years, but it's not too late to see your true colors now, said Shirley coldly. You'll pay dearly for this. Horrified, Imogen held the steel bars. Do you think everyone has your luck, Shirley? You were born to privileges I never would have access to my whole life. What's more, you have the lover that I'll never get my whole life. Don't call me greedy. If you were in my place, you'd end up on this side of the cell, too. Good begets good. You're bad to the bone. Even if you were in my place, you'd still end up on that side of the cell anyway, retorted Shirley coldly. Imogen had finally shed her mask. Shirley thought Imogen would at least feel guilty, but she had overestimated this woman. She's clearly beyond salvation. Of course, you can say that. Do you think you're some sort of saint? You told me you had no feelings for Zacharias, but you still made him yours anyway. I thought you'd never try to make a move on the man I like. You betrayed me first, Imogen sneered. Shirley said calmly, that was just your ploy to keep me out of the race. You managed to make me feel a little bit guilty, but I'm glad I didn't refuse him because of your tricks. From now on, Zacharias is mine. Imogen's face contorted with rage. She held the bars, snarling, you're not worthy of him. Shirley smiled. Well, it's not your place to comment. You will pay for your actions. Imogen finally realized she had to be punished for her crimes, but she sneered. Do you think I'm just going to give up? I never give up, no matter what. As long as I'm alive, we'll meet again, Shirley. I'll hound you like a vengeful ghost. Imogen hated Shirley for exposing her, she hated Shirley for what she did to her. Do you think you're going to an ordinary prison? Still thinking of tasting freedom, eh? Shirley added coldly, treason either ends with a death sentence or a lifetime in prison. We'll never meet again. Shirley was about to leave, and Imogen finally felt terror. She extended her hand, pleading, wait, Shirley. Can you get me a reduced sentence? I don't want to stay in prison my whole life. Shirley left without looking back. She'd rather show mercy to anyone but Imogen. Imogen held the steel bars, slowly sliding to the ground in despair. She closed her eyes, tears of fury and dismay streaming down her cheeks. She'd been trying to make a good life for herself, but all her efforts were ruined because of one little idea. She regretted doing this. If she hadn't asked anyone to kidnap Shirley, she wouldn't have noticed her schemes. Alas, there was no turning back time, and she had to pay for her actions. When Shirley came out, Roy approached her. We can leave now, Miss Lloyd. 
Imogen has to stay back for further investigation, and we're not extraditing her. Shirley nodded. She wouldn't care about Imogen's case anymore. When she returned to the suite, Zacharias stood up and approached her. He held her hand. We have three days of vacation before we go home. Will you spend some quality time with me? Shirley nodded. Of course. All she wanted to do was hold on tight to the people she loved and never let go. I'll pack some clothes, then. We're leaving in half an hour, said Zacharias. He then leaned down for a kiss. Don't think about anything else when you're with me. Shirley smiled and nodded. I won't think about anything else but you. Zacharias ruffled her hair. She's grown a lot after this trip, and she's more direct about her feelings for me. Half an hour later, under the escort of Flores police cars, Zacharias and Shirley were led to a resort reserved for them. Away from the bustle of the city, the roses in the resort bloomed like fairies. When Shirley got out of the car, she thought she had landed in a fairy tale kingdom. It's gorgeous. Shirley sighed. The air was filled with the scent of roses. Zacharias took Shirley's hand. Let's go. Let's enjoy ourselves over the next three days. Shirley followed him into the resort. A group of servants were welcoming them, giving them presents and flowers. Shirley took the flowers. A steward said, Sir, Madam, please take a break on the second floor. We shall serve afternoon tea shortly. Shirley was stunned. Madam, do these people not know the relationship we share? Do they think I'm his wife? Zacharias held his laughter in. He put an arm around Shirley's shoulder and said, Let's head to the second floor then, madam. Shirley pursed her lips, holding her laughter in as Zacharias took her to the second floor. Right after they came to the landing, she gave Zacharias a questioning look. Zacharias chuckled. Don't you like how they address you? Shirley loved it, but she still wasn't his wife, so she felt nervous being addressed that way. I do. Shirley smiled. She then convinced herself, it's not like anyone else is going to hear that here. I'll be your wife, then. Zacharias smiled. This could be a trial run for our marriage, then. Shirley thought it was sweet. We'll see how things go. I can tell my folks we're dating once we get back home. We don't have to be worried about how the public will see us. Shirley and Zacharias took their seats in the lounge on the second floor. Shirley was tired and hungry from the trip here, for it had taken them nearly three hours. A moment later, the steward led a group of servants over to them. The servants were holding exquisite platters, and the food was exquisite. This was where Flores Royalty's guests were served, so everything felt regal. Once the servants had taken their leave, Shirley picked up a nice piece of toast and took a bite. Her eyes lit up. Oh, this is nice. Zacharias hadn't taken his food, but when Shirley said the toast was nice, he took her wrist and fed himself with her toast. He bit on the spot she'd taken a bite out of. It's nice, he praised. Shirley smiled at him. You just love taking my food. Yeah, it tastes better after you have a bite. Zacharias cocked an eyebrow. Shirley felt her cheeks burning up, but she felt sweeter than the dessert before her. After tea time, Shirley wanted to stroll around the rose garden. The place was gorgeous, even a little time in the garden could cheer her up. Zacharias went with her. Shirley walked ahead of him, staring around. Her hair was untied, and it billowed in the wind. Even her profile stunned Zacharias. The roses were gorgeous, but to Zacharias, Shirley was more captivating still. He only had eyes for her and nothing else. Shirley felt his gaze focused on her, and her heart started to race. She turned around, looking at him. He was in a suit, his shoulders were broad, his hair was slick, and his features were sculpted and regal. Shirley looked around. All right, there's no one here. She grinned, approaching Zacharias before holding his shoulder. Zacharias put an arm around her waist and pulled her into his embrace. Then, Shirley kissed him. A surge of warmth, burning for Zacharias, coursed through Shirley's veins. Shyly, she leaned against Zacharias' chest and listened to the beat of his heart. It's cold out here. Let's go inside. Zacharias took her back into the residence. Shirley followed him, but a servant was leading them. This place was huge, and the servant took them to the master bedroom. When Shirley saw her luggage inside, she blinked and looked at Zacharias. Quietly, she asked, they can't be having us share a room, can they? 
Zacharias smiled. A couple always share a room, don't they? But we're not a real couple. Shirley protested quietly. Then we'll become one, replied Zacharias seriously. Quietly, Shirley requested, can't you ask them to free up two rooms for us? Zacharias answered hoarsely, no. They're going to tell everyone we're not on great terms. They won't. Just deal with it and share a room with me for a couple of nights. Zacharias wouldn't help her. Speechless, Shirley bit her lip. She couldn't exactly say if she was looking forward to this, but she wasn't insisting on getting another room. They had a candlelit dinner that night. There were only two of them, but they were served with more than twenty dishes. They weren't big enough to fill the couple, but they tasted good. Shirley had a nice time. After dinner, she went through the art gallery and jewelry exhibit to wash her food down. At nine, she came to the master bedroom. She saw a pink, revealing nightgown on the hanger beside the bed and a gray pair of men's pajamas draped beside it. Shirley stared at the nightgown, stunned. Zacharias crossed his arms, staring at her challengingly. I challenge you to wear that nightgown. Challenge accepted. After all, I have a nice body. Shirley would not refuse a challenge, and she was easily riled up. Zacharias leaned down. Wear it for me tonight. Shirley regretted taking on the challenge and tried to find an excuse. It's pretty chilly tonight, though. I'll make sure the AC is warm enough. Zacharias made sure she couldn't weasel her way out. Shirley had no more excuses. She stared at the nightgown again. No woman can resist this. It's gorgeous. I guess I'll just wear it for him. We're already here anyway, and we're sharing a room now. There's nothing I can't do now. I have some work to do. You do whatever you want. Zacharias led her to the couch. Shirley had nothing to do, so she watched as Zacharias took his laptop out, put it on the table, and stared at the screen. He typed away on the keyboard, sliding on his mousepad. His hands were beautiful. Ah, men are really hot when they work. Zacharias proves just that. Also, he has no idea how hot he is. He never cares about his looks, but that's why men like them are more charming. Shirley looked at the time, deciding not to disturb him. When she picked up her phone, she noticed a text from her mother asking if she was having fun. Shirley put her phone on silent mode and chatted with her mother. The clock struck 10. Zacharias was done with work, and he closed his laptop. He then asked Shirley, are you using the bathroom first, or should I go first instead? Shirley looked at him, go ahead, I challenge you to come in with me. Zacharias smiled. No, Shirley didn't fall for it this time. She realized she had to think every time before she answered Zacharias. Zacharias laughed and got up for a shower. Shirley couldn't even pretend to watch the news. She was distracted by the sloshing of the water in the bathroom, and she got nervous. She stared at the bed that looked incredibly inviting. I have to share that bed with Zacharias tonight. Can I even fall asleep? Shirley became nervous upon thinking about that. She looked at the couch. Hey, I can sleep on the couch. If worse comes to worst, I'll do that. She was engrossed in her thoughts for a while, and the bathroom door creaked open. Zacharias didn't take his pajamas with him. He came out wearing nothing but a towel around his lower body, revealing his muscular build for Shirley's enjoyment. Shirley looked at Zacharias and felt her cheeks burning up. I wonder if I can even sleep while in his arms. Get showered. I'll be waiting in bed, said Zacharias calmly. Shirley got up and took the nightgown. She quickly went into the bathroom, too abashed to meet Zacharias' eyes. After showering, Shirley changed into the nightgown and stood before the mirror. She heaved a sigh. Even Shirley had to say she looked hot, let alone everyone else. Her hair tumbled down her shoulders, fluffy like a cat and sensual like a succubus. Her cheeks were flushed from the shower, and her eyes were glistening. She bit her lip and took a deep breath before she opened the door. Shirley thought Zacharias was already in the bed and probably under the blanket, too, but she was shocked to see him leaning against the wall outside the bathroom. He had worn his gray pajamas, and his belt was loosely tied. His chest was revealed for Shirley to see, obviously trying to flirt with her. Zacharias was smiling at her, a knowing look twinkling in his eyes. Meanwhile, Shirley was starting to breathe faster. Many women would fall for Zacharias without him even trying to flirt. 
Li, Shirley tried to say something. Zacharias pulled her into his embrace. Shirley felt her chin getting grabbed, and Zacharias leaned down for a kiss. He tightened his hold on her, and the silk pajamas they were wearing weren't doing much. They were almost skin to skin. Shirley's heart was racing, and she couldn't hold back anymore. Zacharias pulled her into a world of lust. No matter what happened here, nothing could go wrong. Shirley had long fallen for Zacharias unknowingly. I want you, Shirley. Zacharias' breath slithered down Shirley's neck. He pulled away from the woman and looked at her. When Shirley raised her head, she was met with Zacharias' gaze. It was a gaze filled with desire that had been held back for too long. Nervously, Shirley gulped. She couldn't say no to his face. Instead, she buried her head in his chest and nodded. Okay. Zacharias let out a heavy rush of air. He held Shirley's chin and stopped her from moving away, and he made her look at him. When Shirley saw his eyes again, her heart nearly jumped out of her chest. She could feel Zacharias' desire for her, and he bent down for a kiss. Part of the reason Zacharias lost control of his lust was Shirley herself, but the other part was her nightgown. Hold on, hold on. Shirley was about to let everything loose too, but she held on to the last sliver of her sanity and pushed Zacharias away, panting. Zacharias pressed his forehead against hers, his scorching breath burning Shirley's face. You're going to kill me here. Um, do you have that? Shirley looked at him. She didn't want to have a kid with him for now, so they had to use condoms. Zacharias narrowed his eyes. Give me a moment. I'll tell someone to get it. Oh, so the whole resort's going to know we're FC King tonight. Shirley was embarrassed to let anyone find out, and she didn't think Zacharias would ask someone to get the rubber. Her face was a shade of crimson when Zacharias left. Five minutes later, he came back holding something. He smiled at Shirley and approached her. Shirley saw him holding three condoms. Shirley's face turned a deeper shade of magenta. He got three in one go. Can he even use them all? Can you even use them all? You got a lot there, asked Shirley. Zacharias felt underestimated. Frustrated, he pinned her down on the bed. You underestimate me, Miss Lloyd. Shirley looked at him. Oh no, I flipped his switch. I'm done for. He's going to use all three condoms tonight to prove he can do it. This is my first time. Can I even take three times? For once in Shirley's life, she wanted to run away from a challenge, and she pushed Zacharias. Um, I think I still have something to do. Why don't we sleep in different beds tonight? No one would believe that excuse, especially not Zacharias. She said yes just now, and now she's going to back off. Nope, it won't be that easy. Zacharias leaned down. Okay, I'll just use one condom. He tore Shirley's nightgown away, and then he went down on her. The night was ecstatic, but Shirley realized something by the end of it. Never trust Zacharias. Zacharias went through all three condoms even though he said he would only use one. He took her for a ride the whole night. He can really last. It was 10 in the morning when Shirley woke up. Her hair tumbled behind her shoulders. She had become a woman, though she still had a bit of naivete left in her. She also had an air of maturity around her too. Zacharias was already working. He came into the room and saw Shirley still on the bed, groggy. Feeling for her, he sat on the edge of the bed and ruffled Shirley's unkempt hair. Shirley rubbed her cheek on his arm like a kitten. Disgruntled, she said, next time, keep your promises. Smiling, Zacharias kissed Shirley's forehead. No guarantees. You're too gorgeous. You're blaming me. Shirley looked at him indignantly, but she felt pleased inside. No, this is my fault. Zacharias smiled, his eyes filled with love. A smile curled Shirley's lips as well. Zacharias wanted to kiss her, but Shirley pushed him. I haven't brushed my teeth. Or washed my face. No kissing. I don't mind. Zacharias' eyes were twinkling with a smile. Shirley felt sheepish. She got out of bed and, after being reminded of something, pulled the blanket back. Um, what should we do about this? She turned to look at Zacharias. Zacharias looked at the patch of crimson on the sheets, feeling content. He pulled Shirley into his embrace, promising, I'll take responsibility for this. For life. Shirley knew why he was touched, but she wasn't very traditional. 
She gave her first time to him because she loved and trusted him, not because she wanted to trap him for life. Patting Zachariah's head, she said gently, I did it willingly. Don't feel guilty about it. She smiled. Even if you dump me somewhere down the line, I won't get mad at you. Zacharias froze for a moment before holding Shirley tightly. You're not dumping me after you took my first time. Shirley chuckled. Are you feeling insecure, Zacharias? Zacharias didn't feel insecure. He just thought Shirley was being too carefree. She was like a gust of wind, impossible to tie down. He might lose her one day if he wasn't paying attention. If she ran into someone better than him, he was worried she might dump him. Zacharias raised his head and imperiously said, You're never leaving me. Shirley held his cheeks. Even more imperiously, she said, You're mine. Only mine. Zacharias nodded. I am yours. Throughout the day, the couple enjoyed everything the resort had to offer its scenery, food, and wine. Zacharias took her to the cellar so she could pick the wine herself. Then, he took her hand and strolled through the sea of flowers, watched the sunset, went on a ride, and sauntered on a quiet path in the woods. They could totally be at ease here and enjoy their love. Shirley released her inner child and acted like her true self for once. The trip came to an end on the third day. They returned to town and took an evening flight back to their home country. Shirley and Zacharias had confirmed their relationship on the way home. Even though Shirley was still Zachariah's intern bodyguard, she was treated like his wife in his residence. When Zachariah's car came to Flintstone residence, Roy's men opened the door for him. Sheepishly, Shirley said, I can do this myself. The bodyguard stood beside her, protecting her out of habit. Shirley felt at ease after returning to the Flintstone residence. Later that night, Roy handed a sealed item to Zachariah's. Shirley was coming downstairs. Seeing that, she curiously asked, what's that you're holding? Zacharias quickly hid the item behind him, looking nervous. Shirley had strong observation skills. Even though Zacharias tried his best to act natural, she saw through his stiffness. I can't see it. Shirley crossed her arms. You won't be interested in this, said Zacharias, and he tried to leave. Suddenly, Shirley darted ahead and took the item away. Smugly, she said, someone's suspicious. Since Shirley had taken the item away, Zacharias felt like laughing, but he held it back. If you're that interested, you can open up and check what it is. Hum, he's giving me permission. She opened up the package, and ten boxes of a certain item fell to the ground. Shirley felt petrified seeing the boxes of condoms, and her face turned red. W-Y did you get so many condoms? Shirley was feeling dizzy. Zacharias went down and picked the condoms up. I couldn't possibly buy these myself, so I told Roy to get me a ton of it. Oh, right. Most people can just go into a convenience store and get a box of it if they need to have some sexy time, but if this guy goes into a convenience store to get a box of condoms, he's going to make it to the headlines. That means I'll be on the headline too. You can ask me to get it next time. Shirley was still blushing. Roy's going to be embarrassed buying this stuff after all. Will you do it? Zacharias smiled. Of course. I need this too, so why can't I buy it? Shirley realized she could be more open about bedroom matters now. That night, Shirley took a shower in the guest room. Zacharias was still working, so Shirley didn't disturb him. Instead, she waited for him in her room. Zacharias went into the master bedroom at 11. When he realized it was empty, he was surprised. She's too scared to sleep with me again. Zacharias picked up his pajamas and went to the guest room on the second floor. He opened up Shirley's room and went inside, holding his pajamas. You're sleeping here tonight. Shirley liked her own room, and she nodded. Yes, I'm sleeping here tonight. Spring was coming soon, but the weather was getting colder. Shirley thought it was a blessing she could sleep in a warm embrace. Zacharias went for a shower while Shirley lay on the bed, watching some news. Zacharias came out with nothing but a towel on. He didn't wear his pajamas. Shirley rested her chin on her hand and joked, you look the hottest when you're not wearing anything. Zacharias narrowed his eyes and turned off the lights, plunging the room into darkness. Shirley heard something getting tossed onto the couch. She felt the blanket flying in the air for a moment, and then Zacharias got into the bed. 
Zacharias chuckled. So, you have wished, so shall it be. Shirley felt herself getting pulled into a warm embrace. She could smell the scent of shampoo on Zacharias. It tickled her heart, and she wanted to get closer to him. Holding her nape, Zacharias kissed her. It was a gentle kiss, enough to melt Shirley. She thought she was going to become a puddle. In the dark, she tasted Zacharias, and her whole body was overwhelmed by his scent. He nibbled on her lip and dipped down lower. Shirley was shivering, her hands held by Zacharias. In the darkness, Zacharias took what he wanted from her like a predator. Dawn came. When Shirley opened her eyes, Zacharias had gone to work. Contented, she slept in the place he slept in, sniffing his lingering scent. All she could think of was everything that happened the night before. That was crazy. Zacharias left a note for her on the table, telling her to stay at home and take a break, and if she wanted to leave the house, she must have bodyguards following her around. After that harrowing kidnapping in floor, he would not let her get into any risky situation again. Shirley wanted to swing by her grandmother's place in the afternoon. She didn't ask Zachariah's bodyguards to follow her as she didn't want to waste his resources. If he needed bodyguards, but they were protecting her, he would be in danger. Shirley had nothing to fear back in her home country. Shirley had lunch at her grandmother's place. It had been a long time since Ava saw her granddaughter. She thought the girl felt a little more grown up this time. She noticed the hickey on Shirley's neck, but her eyes weren't as good as they were, so she thought it was a mosquito bite. It's winter. It's not mosquito season, so. Shirley's cheeks burned up. She quickly clapped her hand on the hickey. No, no, it was a mosquito. There was one in my room last night. A big and fierce one, too. Ava said, you have to close the windows. Don't want the bugs to come in. Of course, Grandma. Shirley smiled. Phew, that was close. Curious, Ava asked, so, how's it going between you and the vice president? When's the meeting with the parents? We're getting along well, won't be seeing the parents soon. Shirley was still a little embarrassed about breaking the secret to her parents. Tell him to come over and have dinner sometimes. Not a good idea, Grandma. You know who he is. He can't go around anywhere he wants, said Shirley. Ah, right. The vice president can't visit just anyone he wants to. It was almost five, and Shirley wanted to go home. Just then, someone rang the doorbell. Shirley said, I'll get it, Grandma. She came into the courtyard, and when she saw who was standing outside, her eyes went wide. What brings you here? She was surprised, but she opened the door for Zacharias. Came to see Ava. Zacharias smiled, holding presents up. Shirley knew she was tailed again. How else would he find out I came here? I was just about to go home, and you showed up, said Shirley. We'll have dinner with Ava, then. Zacharias smiled. Well, Grandma wants to see him anyway. Shirley nodded. Sure. Tell Roy to patrol the perimeter. Don't worry. They know what to do without you telling them. Zacharias put an arm around Shirley and took her into the courtyard. Ava wondered who the guest was. She then saw a young man coming in. He was handsome and dashing, just like the perfect grandson-in-law she wanted. Ava stood up, welcoming Zacharias. Hello, Mr. Vice President. Just call me Zach, Ava. Very well then, Zach. Ava didn't like honoraries either. He'll be having dinner with us tonight, said Shirley. Oh, good. I can show off my cooking. Happily, Ava went into the kitchen to work. Shirley wanted to help, but Ava kicked her out. Go and accompany my future grandson-in-law. That was what she said. Shirley covered her mouth and came back out, smiling. She saw Zacharias looking at the photos around the house. Ava's house had an eastern design. Standing in this house, Zacharias looked a little different than he usually was. Shirley came up to him and held his arm. Zacharias smiled. So, when are your parents coming back for Christmas? Oh, he wants to meet my parents. Shirley pursed her lips and shook her head. No idea. They haven't called me yet. She's trying to run away. Zacharias put an arm around Shirley's shoulder. Why don't I invite your family to celebrate Christmas at my place this year? Shirley's eyes went wide. Really? Yes. Should be more fun celebrating Christmas with two families around, said Zacharias. Oh, right. 
There's only him, his dad, and Tony celebrating Christmas anyway. It's a little quiet. Shirley nodded. Sure, we'll celebrate Christmas together. Shirley then helped Ava wash the greens and set up the table. Zacharias fell in love with Shirley Moore, seeing her working hard. Ava made a five-course meal. Homemade food, of course. It felt like home having dinner here. Zacharias felt nostalgic. It had been too long since he had homemade food. Ever since his mother's passing, that household didn't feel like home. Back when he was a teenager, his father hired the best servants around to cook for him, but the food never tasted like home. Now, he found that taste again. Eat your greens, Zach, said Ava. You're a good cook, Ava. I love these. Zacharias smiled. Ava loved the compliments. She liked Zacharias. Both Zacharias and Shirley had their fill. Later, they walked out of Ava's house, and Zacharias suggested they take a walk. Shirley smiled. Don't make things hard for Roy and his men. Let's go home and just walk around the field. Zacharias nodded. Of course. They walked to the car. Even though the stretch of road outside Ava's house was a quiet spot, a car hidden nearby had someone in it aiming their camera at the couple. The person took careful but clear shots. In the photo, Zacharias was holding Shirley's hand, and in the photo of them in the car, Zacharias had an arm around Shirley's shoulder. The person also took photos of Zacharias kissing Shirley's hair and them sharing an embrace. It was obvious they were in love. The person only tucked their phone away after Zacharias' convoy was gone. They sent the pictures to a private account and called someone. What? Those photos I just sent. Latest news. Zacharias is seeing someone. Which family is the lady from? Looking into it ASAP. Tell me everything after you find it. If we want to take Zacharias down, we have to go for his weakness, or he's not going to fall for any tricks. It was our failure that he didn't die in the explosion last time. This time, we can't fail. Understood. We'll find everything we can about that woman and start all preparations. The couple came to the field outside Flintstone residence, where silvery moonlight shone. It was spacious and quiet. On a whim, Shirley jumped onto Zachariah's back. Zacharias quickly held her steady and carried her on his back. Chapter 2621 Shirley rested her head on Zachariah's shoulder and happily enjoyed the piggyback ride. I loved piggyback rides when I was little, said Shirley, reminiscing. You were adorable as a child. Of course, everyone loved to give you piggyback rides. Zacharias smiled. He was reminded of Shirley when she was younger, and he cursed himself for never trying to even give her a hug. Shirley asked, was I really that cute when I was a kid? Yep, you were, said Zacharias honestly, nodding. Shirley was reminded of that time he brought up the talk about kids. If we have kids, I wonder who they'll take after. Me or him. Christmas was coming soon. Shirley got a call from her mother. Her folks were coming back, so she went home and told the servants to clean the whole place. It would be good to have a reunion. It had only been ten minutes after Shirley hung up when her mother called again. It surprised Shirley. Did mom forget to tell me something? She took the call. Hey, mom, anything you need to tell me? I just talked to your grandmother. She told me you're dating Zacharias. Is that true? Angela was shocked like she had heard the most fantastical news. Shirley pursed her lips. Okay, didn't think grandma would spill the tea. Sheepish but honest, Shirley answered, yes, we're dating. Tell us when you're taking him to see us. We need to get ready for it. Angela smiled. Shirley thought Angela would lecture her. After all, she did start dating without telling her family. She didn't think Angela would talk about the meeting with the parents. You and dad have to get ready before you come back. Zachariah said we'll be celebrating Christmas together. Both our families. Oh, that's fast. Angela was delighted. I thought we'd have to wait for a while. You aren't surprised I'm dating someone, mom. Shirley asked, curious. Nope. Who do you think wanted you to get that internship? Not your dad. Yes, it was me all along. I wanted you to date Zacharias. Shirley's eyes went wide. What? Mom got that internship for me on purpose. So, you've been planning this all along, mom. I can't. Shirley was at a loss for words. I know. Unbelievable, right? 
just a hop and a skip, and hey presto, Zacharias is now your fiancé. Angela was happy she made this decision. Shirley was half amused, half annoyed. So, mom set me up. I'll tell your father about this. You kids get along now. Angela hung up. Shirley put her phone down and smiled happily. Maybe Destiny wanted us to be together. Three days later, Shirley was told that Imogen had been extradited. She would serve her sentence in the nation. Her sentence. Life imprisonment. Shirley didn't feel phased hearing that piece of news. Everyone has to pay for their actions. It was late at night. In a private, upscale tea shop, three silhouettes congregated. The light was dim, so their faces could not be seen. On the table were photos of Shirley and her parents. The trio fell into their thoughts. We cannot go after her unless we're out of our minds. Our target is Zacharias. Only when he steps down or disappears will it benefit us or we're going to be kicked out of the game. Zacharias policies are impossible for us. He's obviously coming after us. His ascension to power will rid us of our strength. Apparently, he's dating this woman because he wants the power and backing of her family. They can strengthen his hold on his position. We need to come up with a perfect plan. This time, we cannot let Zacharias escape. The trio's eyes glinted cruelly. These men were Zacharias enemies. They were also the ones who sent killers after Zacharias on the highway, but Lady Luck was on Zacharias' side at that time, and he escaped. In the morning, three days later, Shirley was told that her parents were back. Happily, she drove back home to welcome them. Zacharias had work to do, so he couldn't leave. She was the only one who could come to her parents. Richard was in the garden, watering the flowers. The first thing his wife saw after their return was the wilting of her beloved flowers. It dampened her mood, so the first thing he did was to tend to the flowers. Dad. Shirley called, and she went into the lounge. Angela was in the lounge, sorting out the flowers she bought. She was trimming them, about to house them in her vase. Angela was a woman who loved life. No matter which home she was in, it was a warm and lovely place. Whoa, Mom, you're getting better at flower arrangement. Shirley was always in awe of the art pieces in the house when she came in. Angela smiled. Of course. This is my life's love. She looked past her daughter. You're alone. Where's your boyfriend? He's busy, especially now. Tons of work to do. So he couldn't make it, said Shirley, a little resigned. Angela paused for a moment. Oh, right. I forgot about that. Zacharias is perfect, but he's a super busy man. You'll have to bear with him. His work is monumental, said Angela. I know. Shirley nodded before looking at her mother curiously. Mom, can you tell me how you wooed dad? Angela stopped trimming her flowers for a moment. She recalled her sweet memories, and she said, I made the first move. He was too popular. If I hadn't made the first move, I would never have made him mine. Didn't you only make him yours because he stayed in the base all the time and never got to see any girls? Shirley asked. It was a romantic process, how your father and I met. And one little thing kickstarted our relationship. What is it? A stick of lipstick, said Angela. Was dad that romantic? Shirley smiled. Angela told Shirley about her past, specifically how she met her husband. Shirley thought it was an interesting story, and she was glad she was born into a family filled with love. A while later, Angela took Shirley with her and picked Ava up. They were going to have dinner together that night. Back in Zachariah's office, Freddy asked someone to come in. He presented a report from their secret trackers. After reading the report, Zachariah's face fell. These parasites think they can topple me. We need to make our move, sir. We cannot let them have the high ground. If we had evidence about their involvement in the explosion, we would never have let them run around for so long. Zacharias nodded. Summon the minister for security. We need to work together this time. He raised his head. And on what day am I free? Freddy checked the itinerary. Your schedule for this week is full. Even your meal times are reserved for appointments. See if you can cancel any. Zacharias frowned. No. They're all meetings with foreign guests. You have to be present, said Freddy, a little troubled. Zacharias nodded. I see. You may leave now. After Freddy was gone, Zacharias picked up his phone and called Shirley, gently, he asked. 
Are your folks back? Yes. Are you free after this? My schedule's full for the week, but I'll try to swing by for a visit, Zacharias said. Nothing's more important than your work. They'll understand, Shirley replied. Of course. I'll pay them a visit after I'm done with work. Zacharias sounded apologetic. I'll be staying at my place tonight, then. I probably can't go back to your place for a few days, Shirley said. With her parents around, she couldn't stay overnight at someone else's place. It's all right. Spend some time with your family. Zacharias chuckled. I can hold it in. Shirley chuckled, too. What if I can't hold it in? Then you come to me anytime you want, Zacharias responded in a husky voice. Shirley blushed. It's getting worse. Can we even do it if I go at random times? She then imagined how she would flirt with the serious Zacharias, and she thought she was getting a little pervy. After the call, Shirley went out with her parents to get some Christmas stuff. Moreover, they had to visit their relatives. Three days went by, and not once did Shirley get to see Zacharias. She couldn't even call him at night, worried that he might be seeing guests. She would love to video call him at 11, but it was too late, and she didn't want to disturb him. He would be having an early day the next day. Eventually, Shirley's longing was getting too heavy to bear. The same went for Zacharias. Every day, when he came back home from work, it was already late at night. He missed Shirley dearly, but he didn't want to wake her up, so he held his longing back. Unbeknownst to him, Shirley would also be in her bed thinking about him. Ah, it's so hard just to see him now that I'm not at his place. She started missing the days at his residence. She could see him any time she wanted to. Time passed, and it was now two days before Christmas. It had been five days since Shirley saw Zacharias. She texted him, you busy. Can we meet up for just ten minutes? Zacharias called her. Shirley's heart raced, and she took the call. Hello. Come to my office. I've spared twenty minutes to see you, said Zacharias. His time was valuable his itinerary was even scheduled to minutes. Shirley quickly said, I'm going right now. She hung up, picked up her bag, and trotted to the porch just to backtrack and check her outfit in the mirror. She then got a new outfit and changed into it. Only then did she leave. No one but lovers who were madly in love could understand the delight someone could have when they were on a trip to see their beloved. Even the air was sweet despite how chilly it was. The scenery was gorgeous, and Shirley smiled. After going through a series of checks, she finally stood before Zachariah's building where he worked. The people going around were staff members or those who had important business to settle. She was the only one here to see a guy. Freddy was waiting for the escalator. When he saw her coming out, he said, Ah, Miss Lloyd, you're here. Hey, Mr. Hurst, is the vice president. He's waiting for you in his office. Freddy smiled. Shirley went around Freddy, her cheeks burning. Freddy knows why I'm here, but why am I embarrassed? I'm just here to see Zacharias. Eventually, Shirley was standing in front of the office. For some reason, she was breathing heavily, and as her heart raced, she knocked on the door. Someone opened the door from inside. Zacharias had taken his suit off, leaving a white shirt on. He looked and felt professional, and he radiated a regal air that many leaders had. Shirley could never hold back when something so delightful was standing before her. She acted natural when she came in, but right after she stepped into his office, she pounced on Zacharias. Zacharias held her tightly and closed the door, and then he bolted it. Shirley raised her head. Zacharias pinned her against the wall beside the door. He held her chin, leaning down for a powerful kiss. Electric currents swam through Shirley's body, and she tensed up. We're in his office, his sacred office. Yet now, he's pinning me against a wall and kissing me like crazy. This is thrilling. The more thrilling it was, the more Shirley melted. In the end, she let herself go and went along with the crazy game. She wrapped her arms around Zachariah's neck. The kiss went on for three minutes, and it soothed their longing slightly. Shirley raised her head, her eyes glistening with timidity. Both their eyes were also gleaming with desire. Come to my place tonight, requested Zacharias quietly. Their kiss was not enough to quench his thirst. He had missed Shirley too much. Shirley gulped nervously. I'll tell my folks I'm taking the day off. 
Zacharias looked at the sheepish lady and kissed her forehead. Sure. Shirley wrapped her arms around Zachariah's waist. She loved his cool, alluring scent, and she looked at him closely, trying to see if he was exhausted from all the work. Fortunately, Zacharias seemed to have an abundance of energy. He looked as lively as ever. Have you been busy lately? Zacharias held Shirley's hand and led her to his couch. He picked up his teacup and handed it to her. Shirley took it and had a sip of water before she nodded. A bit, but not as busy as you. Zacharias took a seat, staring at Shirley's face in love. Shirley held up the teacup, enjoying the attention he was giving her. Just then, Zacharias thought of something on a whim. He wanted to take her along for dinner later. I have an appointment tonight. Dinner, if you will. Can you come with me? It was an appointment with another country's vice president. He would bring his wife along as well, so Zacharias wanted to bring Shirley with him. Shirley was a little nervous hearing that she would be meeting an important guest. Me, who are we meeting? Dansbury's vice president and his wife, Zacharias said. She smiled. This will be part of your life eventually. You can practice for it. Shirley realized that marrying Zacharias didn't just mean a regular marriage. She had responsibility. She must stand with him and face the future together. Bravely, she said, of course. I'll go. She was willing to face anything with him. No matter how nervous she was, she must conquer her fears. Marrying him was not an unconditional thing. She must become a woman who could face anything with courage. Zacharias was touched. He pulled her into his embrace and kissed her forehead. Thank you for coming with me. Part of my job. Shirley smiled. This was her honor. When she told her parents about it, they backed her up. They knew the responsibility Zacharias was carrying, and if their daughter wanted to marry him, part of that responsibility would fall on her as well. Noon arrived. Shirley was in the waiting room. A makeup team and outfit team were serving her. These people were professionals. They picked a light green gown that gave off a fresh feeling. It was simple yet elegant. Shirley's hair was curled, which made her look even more elegant. Shirley stood before the mirror, looking at herself. She pursed her lips and took a deep breath. I have to bring my A game tonight. I can't embarrass Zacharias. Then, it was evening. Zacharias stopped working and came out of the conference room. Freddy draped a suit over him and said, Sir, Miss Lloyd awaits you in the waiting room. Zacharias made his way to the waiting room, buttoning his sleeves. Shirley was on the couch, reading. When he saw her, he was stunned by her beauty. She looked gorgeous, with the regal backdrop accentuating her. Zacharias stopped breathing for a moment. Shirley sensed someone coming in. She looked up and saw Zacharias and stood up, smiling. Is it time to go? Zacharias had switched out his necktie for another one, and he hadn't tied it up. He extended his hand. Will you tie my necktie for me? Shirley elegantly approached Zacharias and took the necktie. Zacharias wrapped an arm around her waist and pulled her closer. When Shirley was tying the necktie, he seized the chance to peck her lips. You're gorgeous tonight. Shirley looked at him. I hope I won't embarrass you. You won't. After tonight, the whole world will know we're dating, Zacharias said. Shirley blinked. What? Why? Because the entrance is going to be broadcast to the whole nation live. It's important news making its way to the world. Shirley's eyes went wide. Did he just trick me into making an official announcement about our relationship? Zacharias' convoy was waiting downstairs. Shirley held his arm, following him down. The staff members were already looking at them. They thought the vice president was single, but now they were proven wrong. The vice president not only had a girlfriend, but he had a gorgeous one, too. She was tall, lithe, gorgeous, gentle, and gracious. She was obviously from a rich family. Shirley thought she would get nervous, but with Zacharias by her side, she felt a bubble of invisible strength enveloping her. She stood with him calmly, accepting everyone's stares. They got into the car, and the convoy made its way to the hotel where the dinner would happen. Reporters from all around the world were gathered here, holding up their cameras and mics, waiting for the moment to witness the friendship between the two nations deepening. When Shirley got out of the car, she was blinded by the camera flashes. Okay, everyone's going to know we're dating after this dinner. 
Shirley heard a reporter saying, Vice President Zachariah's Flintstone's fiancé will be attending this dinner as well. Oh, she's gracious. How captivating. Shirley heard that, and she waved at the camera. This was her first time attending something like this, but she grew up having a lot of confidence, as if this was where she was supposed to be. Zacharias was shaking hands with everyone, but he was also holding Shirley's hand at all times. Their interlocked hands were captured by a lot of cameras. Zacharias took Shirley into the Great Hall. There, they met a few more people, and Shirley smiled at all of them. They came to the dining hall on the third floor, and she saw the wife of Dansbury's vice president. She was in a purple dress. Freddie came over and whispered, Miss Lloyd, we've prepared a present for tonight. After dinner is done, we shall present it to the guests in your name. Shirley nodded. She was now representing the nation, and she felt heavy responsibility and duty weighing on her shoulders. Angela was at home, seated before the TV and holding her husband's arm. When she saw her daughter passing through the screen, she teared up, excited. Our girl's finally making a name for herself, said Angela. Richard felt conflicted. He didn't want his daughter to leave his care so soon, but Zacharias was the perfect husband for Shirley. He had to let her go. When his wife told him to let Shirley intern at Flintstone residence, he objected to it, but he eventually relented. Now that Shirley and Zacharias were in love, he didn't have to worry about his daughter's love life anymore. Still, he knew that once Shirley became Zachariah's wife, responsibility and danger would come to her, just like how they came to Zachariah's. Richard narrowed his eyes. I will keep my daughter safe. It was time for dinner. Shirley chatted in Chinese with the wife of Dansbury's vice president. She was well-read and knew a lot of stuff, and the second lady of Dansbury was interested in their nation's histories. Shirley was a history enthusiast, too, so the second lady got a lot of answers to her questions from Shirley. She was impressed by this young lady. Shirley left a good impression on her. After dinner, Shirley took a present from the waiter and presented it to the second lady of Dansbury. Delighted, the lady hugged Shirley and gave her a present in return. The dinner finally came to an end, and Shirley eased up a little. She stood with Zacharias, sending the second lady and gentlemen of Dansbury off. Once their vehicle was out of sight, Shirley heaved a sigh of relief. She raised her head, asking, Did I embarrass you? Zacharias put an arm around Shirley's waist and leaned down. No, you made me proud. Shirley smiled. That was the best praise she could receive. Zacharias took her into the car, but before that, Shirley saw the waiter walking to them with the present. She asked Zacharias, where are we sending this gift? Amused, Zacharias said, the second lady of Dansbury gave you that. It belongs to you. Shirley was surprised she could keep the present. Take it, it's your prize. Zacharias chuckled. He told his bodyguards to take the presents while he took Shirley into the car. Shirley got into the car, and someone texted her. She picked up her phone and realized it was from her mother. Your father and I are going to Elliot's place. We're probably going to stay at their family's hotel. You do whatever you want tonight. Shirley heaved a sigh of relief. She was going to come up with an excuse not to go home later, but her mother gave her one. Sure, mom. Can do, Shirley texted. Zacharias huddled closer. Who are you talking to? My mom. She and my dad won't be home tonight, so I don't have to go home either. Shirley smiled at Zacharias. Zacharias was surprised. Really? You can come to my place tonight? I didn't say I was going to your place. I'm going to grandma's, Shirley teased. Zacharias held her hand at once and imperiously said, You're not going anywhere but my place tonight. Shirley chuckled and said nothing more. The bodyguards had entered the car as well. Can't flirt with them around. The convoy made their way to the Flintstone residence. Shirley was excited all the way, and she couldn't wait to get there. They finally arrived at the residence. Zacharias got out of the car and saw a red supercar parked in the courtyard. He frowned. Shirley looked at the red car too, and she paused for a few moments. That's Tony's car he's here too. Is Tony staying here? Shirley asked curiously. Zacharias said, no, he's leaving in a bit. Shirley glanced at the look on Zachariah's face and realized that Tony would be kicked out. She felt sorry for the guy. 
Tony was in the living room, lounging on the leather couch. He was munching on a bag of snacks while watching a movie. When he saw Shirley, he happily said, My goddess, you're here. It's been days since I saw you. What brings you here? I'm staying here for a bit, said Tony. This was like his home anyway. Zacharias let Shirley go and approached Tony. Come out. We need to talk. Tony blinked and looked at his uncle and then at the gorgeously dressed Shirley. At once, he knew he couldn't stay tonight. Okay, Zacharias. Tony stood up and followed Zacharias out. Tony said, don't stay here tonight. Go to my dad's place. You're kicking me out just to date my goddess, aren't you? It won't be that easy. Tony's eyes twinkled with mischief. Tony wasn't going to leave without getting anything. What do you want? Zacharias knew his nephew wasn't one to acquiesce that easily. I'm kinda tight on money lately. Tony was delighted. I can get money from him now. How much do you want? Zacharias narrowed his eyes dangerously. Not much. Fifteen grand. It's not easy getting fifteen grand from him. Zacharias scoffed. Fifteen hundred. I'm not leaving, then. I'm going to stay here tonight. You're not going to flirt with my goddess. Tony opened the door and was about to get in. Zacharias relented. Fine, I'll do it. Tony pulled his hand back and turned back around with a smile. Give me the money before you leave. I don't want you breaking your promise. Zacharias took his phone out and gave Tony the money. Fifteen grand. Tony cursed himself. Man, that was quick. Maybe I should have asked for more. He could have given me seventy-five grand if I asked. Too late for regrets. Now leave, snapped Zacharias. We can't have this guy here ruining things for us. Tony said, right away. When he came back into the lounge, Shirley was having some water. He pretended he had to leave. See you next time, my goddess. I have to go now. Urgent stuff. Zacharias shot Tony a sharp look. The guy took his car key and left, and then he was gone from the residence. Shirley smiled, watching Zacharias turn the TV off. She didn't ask him how he managed to chase Tony out. She pretended none of this had happened. It's still early. Do you want to work for a bit? She asked. Zacharias took the glass of water and gazed at Shirley. Do you think I'm still in the mood to work tonight? Shirley felt electrified for a moment. Zacharias' gaze was like fire, and she melted for him. My time is yours tonight. Zacharias put the glass down and hugged Shirley. Work's important, but you're more important. Shirley wrapped her arms around him. She missed him so much, and that hug squeezed out all her longing for him. She rubbed her cheeks against his chest. Okay, then. Let's go upstairs. Zacharias picked her up and carried her in his arms. Shirley giggled, wrapping her arms around his neck. I don't want to tire you out. Put me down. Zacharias didn't listen to her and took her upstairs instead. Shirley enjoyed his firm hold on her. She felt safe and secure in his arms. She thought he would at least put her down so she could have some rest, but he didn't. Instead, he took her to the battlefield. His bed. Shirley's heart started to race. She did miss him a lot, but this was too quick and straightforward. Shouldn't we? Shirley couldn't think of anything else better to do with the time, and her cheeks burned. What's going on with me? Why am I so lewd ever since meeting him? I need to take a shower. Shirley sat up. Zacharias stopped halfway through, taking his suit off, and he smiled. Sure, go ahead. Shirley was about to go in, but Zacharias hugged her from behind. He unzipped her gown, revealing her beautiful back, and he kissed her shoulder. Go. Shirley's heart raced faster. Zacharias did a little favor for her, and she felt loved. Shirley went into the bathroom. Once the water started running, she couldn't hear what was happening outside. She just wanted to have a serious shower. Unbeknownst to her, a dangerous, ravenous silhouette was standing outside the bathroom, and then it opened the door. The bathroom didn't have a lock inside, so it made it easy for him to come in. When Shirley heard the door opening, she turned around and quickly hid herself in the steam. Why did you? We're showering together. Zacharias smiled and came in. Shirley blushed. Is it too late to say no? Yes. Zacharias held her waist and the back of her head, and then he kissed her. Shirley moaned and was pulled into Zacharias' embrace. 
He led the action in the steamy bathroom. They then took the battle to the bed. Shirley had no idea how much time had passed, but she was eventually exhausted, and she was usually a vivacious person. She lay in Zachariah's arms languidly, with Neri the strength to even open her eyes. Zachariah's was combing her hair. He was radiating warmth, like a tiger who had its fill. Shirley had a look of enjoyment on her face, a smile curling her lips. Zachariah's kissed her. Sleep. Shirley didn't even want to think. She was so tired, she just wanted to sleep, and she fell asleep in Zachariah's arms a while later. He kissed her hair and fell asleep with Shirley in his arms. Dawn came. Shirley opened her eyes and found that Zachariah's was already gone, though he left a note for her. He told her to get breakfast after she woke up, and then someone would take her home. Shirley wanted to stay, but Zachariah's was going to work immediately, and with Christmas coming, he would have a lot more to deal with. Shirley went home. Right after that, she got news that her father would bring his whole family back to the base for Christmas. That included her. Shirley was shocked. Why are we going back to the base? Can't we celebrate Christmas here? Shirley quickly asked. Tons of things to settle at the base. Pack up your stuff, Shirley. We're setting off at six. Shirley wanted to stay, but her parents would be at the base, and as their daughter, she had to celebrate Christmas with them. Back in the bedroom, Angela said, Richard, you could have told Shirley about this. She's confused right now. Richard shook her head. I can't, or she won't leave. Zacharias is dealing with some dangerous individuals right now, and he's worried she might get dragged into the mess. Earlier in the morning, Zacharias called Richard and asked them to take Shirley back to the base. He was dealing with some dangerous people who had intel on a lot of stuff, including Shirley's details. Shirley went back to her room. Resigned, she called Zacharias. I have to go back to the base. Hello, Zacharias asked. Zach, my dad just said we'll be celebrating Christmas at the base. I might have to go with him, said Shirley, a little resigned. It's all right, Sheer. We'll meet after Christmas. I can't leave work right now either, so you spend some time with your folks, said Zacharias, consoling Shirley. Shirley had no choice but to listen to him. I will. You take care of yourself. Don't work through the night, all right? Yeah, I know. I won't, said Zacharias in a husky voice. I'd love to see you again before I leave. Shirley bit her lip. Richard was in a hurry, though. They had to leave by six, so she wouldn't be able to do that. Go to the base with your folks, all right? I'll see you there after Christmas. Really? Shirley asked, surprised. Yes, we have a deal. You're coming to the base for me after Christmas. Shirley was delighted. She grew up in the base, and she was more than happy to take Zacharias on a tour. After getting her spirits lifted, Shirley packed her things. Back at Zacharias' office, Zacharias put his phone down and heaved a sigh. Now that Shirley and her parents are safe, it's time to settle a score. This will be a hard battle. The enemies hidden in the dark were going to make their move too. There would be an election after Christmas. So, Zacharias planned to get rid of some people then. Those people were also trying to eliminate Zacharias and instate one of their supporters in the position of vice president. A quiet war had drawn its curtains. The people were oblivious to the raging undercurrents. The plan for Zacharias' trip to Easternia is underway. We'll make our move there. It's a remote island, and no media's going to be alerted. All we have to do is kill Zacharias and his men and make the seabed cave in. We'll then tell everyone that it was a natural disaster, and Zacharias will cease from being a thorn in our side. Sounds perfect. Execute it well, and we'll have nothing to worry about anymore. We cannot fail this time, or we'll never know peace. Shirley and her family arrived at the airport that afternoon. After she handed her luggage to Richard's underling, she sat with Ava. Ava was delighted to make this trip, whereas Angela kept checking on Shirley and saw her staring out the window. It was as if she was reluctant to leave. She truly felt for her daughter. It was difficult for anyone to stay away from their lover when they were in the honeymoon phase. After Shirley's flight took off, Zacharias came out of his office. His motorcade was waiting for him. He would have to go to Easternia next. A new secret base was being built there. He had to be there to sign the papers and call a meeting. 
The motorcade came to the port. Freddy and Roy followed Zacharias closely. Apart from Zacharias' eight bodyguards, the Minister of Security and his men would be tagging along as well. After Zacharias boarded the ship, someone in a car hidden nearby pulled the telescope away, and they texted, Zacharias has boarded the ship. The person who received the text made a call. They said, Target has set sail. Get ready. Zacharias was in his waiting room on the ship. Freddy was working, but his heart wasn't in it. He closed his laptop and looked at his composed boss. Yet, he couldn't stop the increasing anxiety welling up in his heart. The minister of security came in holding a laptop. His underling was typing away. It seemed that they had managed to intercept a few phone signals. Sir, they're starting to communicate, and we've intercepted all the messages. Keep that as evidence, instructed Zacharias. We've apprehended all the spies they installed among us. The island is now under our control. We'll be able to lure them onto the island and capture all of them by 10 p.m. at the latest. We'll have enough evidence and witnesses by then. I'm certain that they will not escape court-martial. Zacharias nodded. He was setting himself up as bait. Thus, he had already expected that several sharks would come out to play. Richard had gone to the plane's cabin. His phone was left on his seat. Shirley heard someone texting her father as he had only kept his phone on vibrate. She could check her father's phone anytime she wanted, especially since the passcode was her birthday. So, she sneakily picked up the phone, trying to see who was texting her father. When she noticed the chat history between her father and Zacharias, she was momentarily stunned. Then, she didn't hesitate to scroll through the conversation. They were all simple texts. Be careful. That was what Richard texted Zacharias earlier that morning. Don't worry, Richard. Everything is under control. That was from Zacharias. Tell me if anything happens. That was from Richard. Understood. The texts would seem nonsensical to outsiders. However, Shirley's heart sank as she understood the implications. She knew right then why her father was taking them back to the base in such a hurry. He didn't have anything urgent to settle at all. Instead, Zacharias was going through some dangerous operation. That was why her father had to take her into hiding. What kind of operation is it this time? Shirley was reminded of the assassination attempt that had occurred last time. This had to have something to do with that. Who is Zacharias fighting? Shirley grabbed her phone and headed toward the cabin. Richard was fiddling with a machine when he suddenly saw his precious daughter coming in. He looked up and asked, why are you here? She handed him the phone with a firm resolve. Dad, please instruct your men to turn around. I need to go back to Averna. Richard looked at the phone she handed him. He didn't even need to guess to know that his daughter was aware of his communication with Zacharias. Don't be unreasonable. He took the phone and said, go back to your seat. What if I parachute off the plane then? She looked at her father and only became even more determined. He was immediately startled. So, he quickly grabbed her. Don't act rashly at this altitude. Tell me what mission Zacharias is undertaking then. Why did he send me away? Is it perilous? Shirley sat across from her father. Although she was overwhelmed by anxiety and on the verge of tears, she remained composed on the surface. Richard looked at his daughter and suddenly felt his heart pang. He sighed wearily as he spoke, Shirley, of course, I would love nothing more than to allow you to return. However, there's a chance that Zacharias would get distracted if you're in Averna. She couldn't help but grip her father's hand as her eyes turned red-rimmed. Dad, please, I beg you, turn the plane around, send me back there, at least let me know if he's safe. Please. Richard knew the daughter he had raised wasn't one to get flustered easily. She was usually calm and rational. So, he felt pain to see her in such emotional distress for the first time. In the end, what else could he do but support his daughter in her endeavors? Nixon, turn the plane around, Richard called out to the cockpit. Understood, Mr. Lloyd. The plane smoothly switched to another route. There wasn't even a hint of turbulence. Richard took out a satellite phone and dialed a number before giving an order on the other end, saying sternly, keep an eye on the situation at Easternia. Immediately report to me if any strange activities are happening. Shirley sat beside her father. Dad, do you know who he's dealing with? 
A few people who are capable of collectively challenging his position. It's definitely not something ordinary folks can intervene in. These individuals wield extensive influence and have numerous subordinates. Zacharias sent you away so he could focus on his task without worrying about you. Richard didn't bother hiding the truth from her. He had received a heads up from Ren about this matter because they had been setting up a trap all this time. They were going to use this opportunity to take down several major players capable of causing massive upheaval in one fell swoop. Shirley's heart instantly tightened as her mind started racing. Even though she understood that Zacharias wanted to protect her, all she wanted to do was stay by his side and support him in any way she could. She didn't want to be apart from him at all. The plane swiftly flew to the military airport in Averna. Richard had already scheduled for a car in advance. Nonetheless, he arranged for another car to take Angela and Ava home. Meanwhile, he took Shirley and headed straight in a particular direction. Shirley's heartstrings were taut throughout the entire journey. She knew the people Zacharias was dealing with at this time were extraordinarily dangerous. Those who could challenge his status were undoubtedly deeply entrenched in this battle. Dad, does he stand a chance? She asked Richard nervously. We're not sure. Can I go to the island? Shirley begged earnestly. Dad, please take me to the island. Do you really want to go? Richard turned to ask. He had trained Shirley himself and had complete confidence in her abilities. Still, he couldn't bear to see her take such risks. Dad, trust me, I can handle it. Shirley nodded resolutely. She wanted to stand side by side with Zacharias and support him through this battle. Just then, she was standing by the railing at the dock when she suddenly saw a series of fireworks exploding in the air from the distant island. So, she pointed at it and said urgently, Dad, something's happening over there. She looked at the explosions and flashes on the island. Those only indicated that the battle had officially begun. Dad, let's go over there. I beg of you, pleaded Shirley. At this moment, her entire heart flew toward the island. Suddenly, there was a deafening sound of rotor blades as three military helicopters hovered in the sky. Soon, one of them descended steadily onto the road. Shirley tugged Richard over, exclaiming, Dad, let's go. I want to go, too. Chapter 2631 Richard couldn't resist turning Shirley's down. Still, he had to set some ground rules as he spoke sternly, fine, on two conditions. Once we're there, you are not to leave my sight and will stay close to the team. Understood, Mr. Lloyd. Shirley immediately transformed into one of her father's subordinates and saluted. Richard and his daughter boarded the helicopter. A complete set of gear was immediately provided to her, and she wasted no time putting it on. At this moment, she wished desperately that she could teleport herself to that island. As they approached the island, the flashes of explosions became more visible and audible. There was no doubt that the battle was a difficult one, and everyone involved had no intention of leaving until the other was pronounced dead on the battlefield. Besides, they had heard through credible sources that the opposing side had hired several mercenaries to the island to engage in a gunfight with Zachariah's men. Richard hadn't anticipated this audacity from the prey that dared to confront Zachariah's people. So, he was thankful he had listened to Shirley's suggestion to make this trip. Otherwise, how could he tell his beloved daughter that something awful had happened to Zacharias? So, he accompanied his daughter to rescue Zacharias. Dad, please be careful too. Shirley worried not only about Zacharias but also about Richard. Nixon, take Shirley and take this road. Don't worry, Mr. Lloyd. Leave it to me. I'll make sure Miss Lloyd stays safe. Shirley glanced at her phone and was just about to send a message to Zacharias when she realized that there was no signal on the island. She immediately turned to Richard and informed him, intoning seriously, Dad, the communication here has been intercepted and cut off. This place has become a complete war zone. Richard immediately whisked out his phone and attempted to use satellite signals. Alas, all his efforts were futile, as the results only confirmed his daughter's speculations. Hence, he quickly understood that they had all underestimated the adversaries Zacharias was battling against. The opposing force had somehow managed to control the entire island and had established a powerful signal jamming field that disrupted all communications. Surely, be careful. Stick with Nixon and the others. 
Don't venture out alone. Okay, I'll find Zacharias. We'll rendezvous at this drop site once I do, Shirley said as Richard was heading toward the side where the gunfight was going strong. She and her father had no choice but to part ways now that the battle wasn't looking great. At this moment, Zachariah's forces were engaged in a battle with the opposition on the eastern side of the island. Her mission was to find Zachariah's, while Richard's mission was to join the gunfight. Zachariah's was currently stuck in a cave. Just moments ago, the Minister of Security had betrayed him. He hadn't expected that one of the elders he trusted the most would end up colluding with the opposition. Mr. Flintstone, we were careless. Who would have thought even the minister, Freddy punched a rock as he was deeply disappointed by this elder he had respected greatly. Zachariah's eyes flashed with anger. We underestimated them. These people are everywhere. It's no wonder that they could get their hands on the highest ranking officials. Mr. Flintstone, there's no signal, and we can't contact any outside support. We're stranded and alone. Now, it's all up to us if we want to get ourselves out of this place, Freddy said while changing a magazine. Even our bullets are running low. I'm not sure how long they'll last. Zacharias patted him on the back. We'll fight them to the end. Even if we don't make it back alive, we should never yield to the likes of those scum. Freddy, who was encouraged, nodded in agreement. Mr. Flintstone, I'll ensure your safe return even if it costs me my life. Zacharias was touched as he chuckled. If you have a chance to escape, take it. Don't worry about me. No way. Miss Lloyd is waiting for you. Mr. Flintstone, you need to get out of here, Freddy said, trying to motivate him. Zacharias smiled with a touch of bitterness and regret in his eyes. If I never get to be with her in this life, I suppose I'll have to wait for the next. Just as Zacharias was lamenting the cruelty of fate, Roy rushed into the cave while clutching his injured arm. Mr. Flintstone, a few helicopters just landed on the island. It seems like reinforcements have arrived. But, we can't call for reinforcements, so who could it be? Freddy blurted in surprise. I don't know, but someone joined the gunfight. They looked like military personnel from our side, Roy reported. Zachariah's pupils were slightly dilated as his heart started pounding. Although he had his suspicions about who those people were, he hoped with all his heart that it wasn't who he was thinking of. Richard had promised to take her away. There was no way he would allow her to return. Therefore, there was definitely no chance Richard would bring his daughter to the battlefield. Who could it be? Freddy speculated. This team was arranged by Mr. Watts, and they had no means to contact reinforcements. So, who would suddenly join the battle? Whoever it is, at least we're not fighting alone. Mr. Flintstone, let's head south toward the forest. It's a good hiding spot where we won't be discovered easily, Freddy suggested. Zacharias had a hunch, and it wasn't just anyone who arrived. Those men were probably Richard's men. Could she be here too? Meanwhile, Richard soon realized that this wasn't the simple situation that Zacharias had described. He had years of experience under his belt. Naturally, he could tell that this was an assassination attempt on Zacharias. Richard encountered an assassin head-on. When the assassin caught sight of him, he hesitated briefly before asking, Who are you? Richard's appearance wasn't on their hit list. So, the assassin didn't want to make a mistake and cause irreparable damage. My target is Zacharias Flintstone, Richard replied promptly. The assassin heaved a sigh of relief. You're Mr. Webb's men, right? No wonder I haven't seen you here before. Richard could barely hide the shock in his eyes. Zane Webb. Did he betray Zacharias? If he was right, that meant that Zacharias' decision to come to the island with Zane was indeed part of a massive conspiracy. Yes, I'm with Mr. Webb. Where exactly is Zacharias right now? All signals on the island are cut off. No external communication can come through. Not even satellite signals. It's quite the thrill. I would have never imagined that I would have a chance to hunt down the vice president like this. This is truly one hunting game that no other can top in my lifetime. The assassin lit a cigarette and spoke casually, so, don't worry. There's no rush. We have plenty of people here. There's no way he can escape from our clutches. Besides, there's no point working so hard when we're all going to get paid the same regardless of who kills him. 
Richard's fists clenched. He hadn't expected such audacity to occur right under Ren's nose, especially with Zacharias as the target. Want a sig? I can bet all my savings that Zacharias never once suspected that Mr. Webb would be one of ours. You know, we almost killed him earlier. Unfortunately, his men reacted quickly and saved him at the very last second, the assassin said while finishing the cigarette and crushing it underfoot. He probably fled south. It's an undeveloped area. So, that's their best bet if they want to lay low and regroup. At that moment, someone called out to him, Tiger, let's go. We're heading south. This is our new member. Let's go together. Tiger, who mistook Richard for a seasoned mercenary due to his demeanor, invited him along. Richard looked rather young for his age. As a result, he appeared to be in his early forties. Plus, he exuded a disciplined military aura that made Tiger assume he was a long-term mercenary. Let's move. Richard followed them immediately. Then, he grabbed some dust from the ground and smeared it on his face. Tiger did the same upon seeing this. Looks like you've got a whole lot of experience, buddy. You'd better cover me later. Richard patted his shoulder. We'll watch out for each other. I can't wait to pull the trigger on that young vice president. Richard's men were protecting Shirley, so it was advantageous for him to blend in with the group alone. He had directed Shirley south earlier in hopes she would meet with Zacharias. At this moment, Zacharias' safety was paramount. The situation had spiraled so out of control that even he was willing to become one of Zacharias' protectors. Since this wasn't a mere battle of lives but a battle of power and defending the country's highest authority against traitors, he would do everything in his power to uphold his duty as a soldier. Meanwhile, Shirley and a few of her father's men sped down the road under the cover of night. Shirley seemed comfortable navigating her way through the darkness due to the training and exposure she had been given under her father's guidance. Still, she couldn't help but feel worried as she was unaware of the events on the island. The tense atmosphere of impending conflict made her extremely anxious. How was Zacharias? Where was he? Miss Lloyd, be careful. Nixon cautioned her. Don't worry, let's split up and search, Shirley said. As they ventured deeper into the south, darkness engulfed them like a monstrous cloud. The area was lit only by the moonlight and their flashlights. They were equipped adequately, and their primary goal was to rendezvous with Zacharias amidst the tension that hung thick in the air. Soon, they arrived at a wooded area near a beach. Nixon spotted a flicker of light from a cave not far away. So, he immediately shielded Shirley and whispered, Miss Lloyd, there's someone in that cave. I'll scout the area up ahead. He immediately turned around to get a visual on her. Yet, Shirley was gone. She had already moved ahead. Hey, Miss Lloyd, be careful. Nixon waved, and his men swiftly followed. Shirley was extremely anxious at this moment. She could tell that something was wrong on this island as time passed. All her devices were malfunctioning. Why would someone go through all this effort just to jam the signals within this island? Just what clandestine agenda were they plotting? Her mind already had an inkling of what the answer was. They wanted to deal with someone. Someone of significant status Zacharias. She trod the difficult path ahead effortlessly. Although the terrain was challenging, her movements were swift and agile. It was as if she was a ghost gliding through all her obstacles. When her companions saw that, they had to acknowledge that the child personally trained by their leader truly possessed exceptional skills. Sure enough, Shirley was soon near the cave. She crouched beside a rock while peering through a pair of binoculars, intending to observe the situation from a safe distance. Suddenly, someone emerged from the cave. She couldn't see the person's face clearly. Still, she could recognize the person from his silhouette. It was Roy. Her heart surged with excitement and joy. She turned to Nixon. That should be where Zacharias is hiding, Mr. Nixon. I'm going there now, and you can join me in a bit. Miss Lloyd, Nixon hadn't even finished his sentence when Shirley rushed to the cave. Lord, it's tiring to keep an eye on kids. Nixon sighed as he signaled for his four men to follow. Shirley swiftly arrived near the cave entrance. At this moment, she knew that she could not afford to enter rashly as it could spark a misunderstanding. Since the situation was dire, Zachariah's men had no way of differentiating allies apart from enemies. 
Thus, she had to move cautiously to prevent a needless conflict from sparking. She threw a stone to knock against the wall. Soon, a figure carefully emerged from the cave to inspect the noise. Shirley recognized him as one of Roy's men. So, she immediately seized his gun, covered his mouth, and dragged him into the shadows. I'm Shirley Lloyd, she whispered into his ear. The man dropped his guard upon hearing her name and turned to confirm her identity. He was pleasantly surprised. Miss Lloyd, what are you doing here? Where's Mr. Flintstone? He's inside. Is he injured? Shirley's heart clenched. Mr. Flintstone isn't injured, but Roy is. We've also lost two men before we managed to retreat here. Shirley called out, Mr. Nixon, come out. They are Zachariah's men. After that, she made her way briskly into the cave. She had only taken a few steps into the cave when she found a group of people either sitting or standing. Meanwhile, Zacharias was leaning against the wall. His suit was undone, and his tie was missing. She took a good look at him and soon saw that his dark hair was also slightly disheveled. Nevertheless, his authoritative presence remained undiminished. He spotted the girl rushing in and was unsure whether to be glad or concerned. He was overjoyed that she brought reinforcement with her but worried as he would rather that she not be here in the first place. Miss Lloyd, you're here. Roy exclaimed as he felt his tense nerves relax slightly. Even Freddy breathed a sigh of relief, reinforcements had finally arrived to their aid. Shirley's gaze was fixed on Zacharias. Although she hadn't spoken, it was clear that she was checking whether he had sustained any injuries. Zachariah's tall figure moved past his men before grabbing hold of Shirley and pulling her toward a side cave. She was led several meters inside and pushed against the wall. His voice was firm, as if he was issuing a command, saying sternly, return to where you came from. Stop meddling. It's dangerous out here. Since Shirley had already begged her father to bring her here, she wouldn't leave without at least dragging Zacharias back with her. So, she pushed his hand away and arched her eyebrows. Mr. Zacharias, the only identity that matters the moment I stepped into this cave is being your bodyguard. I'm here to ensure your safety and do my job. Zacharias' eyebrows furrowed, and his voice was hoarse. Listen to me, it's dangerous here, I don't want you to get hurt. Do you think that I could possibly live a peaceful life if you're hurt or, worse, killed? She raised her chin, and her eyes were shining bright. Or do you think that I can marry someone else after losing you? Zacharias was momentarily taken aback. He was well aware that neither of them could bear to part with the other, nor could they afford to lose the other. Now that I'm here, I won't leave, Shirley asserted firmly. He had always thought that the power he wielded was effective at any given time. Alas, he didn't expect that it would be completely useless against her. Miss Lloyd, how many people have you brought over? Freddy inquired as he approached the duo. There are eight of us, including my father and me. Four are with me, while two are with my father, Shirley replied succinctly. The other side has at least fifty people. What are we going to do now? The disparity in strength is far too great. Freddy sighed. How did this happen? Didn't you arrange for manpower when you set out? She asked as her brows furrowed in confusion. We did arrange for a task force. Unfortunately, Mr. Watts was the organizer. So, we only realized that Mr. Watts was also an enemy once we made it here. This was a trap from the get-go. Anyone who has set foot on this island is their target, and they're shooting to kill, Freddy explained with a vexed look on his face. The expression he was currently wearing was quite a stark contrast to his usual warm smile. Shirley looked up at Zacharias. At this moment, she knew that he was definitely hurt and disappointed. The one he trusted, one of his inner circle, had betrayed him. It's a disgrace. He was even Mr. Flintstone's friend. So, Mr. Zacharias naturally held him in high regard and placed a great deal of trust in him. Who would have thought something like this could happen? Roy huffed angrily. There's no point dwelling on it now that we're in this situation. We need to come up with a plan if we want to get out of here and make them pay, Zacharias said while glancing at Shirley. He couldn't let her die here, not on his watch. Shirley's gaze was fixed on him as well. Her eyes conveyed that even if she were to die here, she would do anything to save him. 
The selfless concern they bore for one another was just another reason that neither of them would be able to let the other go. The mutual sentiment they shared motivated them to get back down to business even though they were stuck between a rock and a hard place. Nixon pondered over their options as he said carefully, it's not that we don't have reinforcements on the way. The problem is that we're not sure whether they could make it on time. We have reinforcements. Are you sure about that? The operation this time was confidential, and Mr. Webb cut off all possible support routes. We. If only you knew just how much Mrs. Lloyd cares for Mr. Lloyd, then you'd know she'd definitely notice something amiss. Plus, Miss Lloyd is here, Nixon interjected confidently. Are you saying my mother will call for help? Shirley's eyes brightened with hope. I'm certain that Mrs. Lloyd will do so, Nixon affirmed, utterly convinced. Indeed, he was correct in his assumption. Angela had noticed it was past 11 p.m., and neither her husband nor her daughter had returned. Although she was safe at home, how could she possibly sleep? She had tried calling them without success. Then, she attempted to call Richard's associates. Alas, she couldn't reach anyone either. Angela, who was accustomed to living with Richard for years, was keenly attuned to danger. This prompted her to call her husband's subordinate, who was stationed nearby. Jace, find out where Richard is right now. I need to know where he is. Of course, Mrs. Lloyd. The man wasted no time carrying out her command. In less than a minute, he reported, it's strange. We can't track Mr. Lloyd's location at all. What do you mean you can't track him? Don't you have the most advanced tracking devices available? Angela questioned sharply. Jace was unable to locate him after several attempts. Eventually, he raised his suspicions and suggested tentatively, Mr. Lloyd may be stuck in a location that has somehow jammed all signals. Angela quickly started recalling just where her husband and daughter had gone. Wasn't it where Zacharias was supposed to deal with those dangerous individuals? Now that she couldn't reach them, it was evident they were in danger. Jace, quickly dispatch people to Easternia. Immediately, Richard is in danger, and even Mr. Flintstone is in danger. Hurry, Angela urged urgently. Then, her next call was to Wren, and she explained the situation to him. Shortly after, six helicopters took off, and the special forces were mobilized in the nearest base to Easternia. On the other hand, Zacharias and the others decided to head to where Nixon and the others had parked the helicopter after their lengthy discussion in the cave. They intended to leave this place as soon as possible. Zacharias wanted to ensure Shirley's departure. Shirley was of the same mind, except she wanted to ensure his departure from this hazardous island. They had just popped out of the cave when they heard sudden gunshots echoing in the darkness. They're here. Move. Quickly. Roy hissed urgently. Everyone immediately headed south. Zacharias reached out to take Shirley's hand and intended to lead her away. Alas, she took her bodyguarding job seriously as she covered his six. Don't worry about me. I can handle this. Miss Lloyd, just go. If you don't go, how can Mr. Flintstone leave? Freddy pointed out, knowing just what Zacharias was thinking. He's right, Zacharias spoke up immediately. Shirley could only turn to Nixon, Mr. Nixon, you and the others cover our rear. I'll lead him to our rendezvous point. Go ahead, Miss Lloyd. We'll take care of these people, Nixon said. She swiftly led Zacharias toward the east under the cover of night. The trees and rocky paths alongside the sandy beach made for a challenging route. Alas, Shirley stepped on a rock in her hurry and slipped. Fortunately, Zacharias managed to reach out and grab her waist before she could fall. Be careful. She nodded and also held on to him. Let's move quickly. The gunfire from behind was getting closer. Judging from the gunshots, they were being boxed in. Since they only had a few men protecting them, Shirley and Zacharias had no choice but to make a break toward the east. Even though they would end up looking like utter barbarians, they couldn't afford to waste even a single second. They finally spotted the three helicopters at their rendezvous point under the moonlight. These helicopters were situated in a rather secluded area. So, they hadn't been discovered by the enemy forces yet. Moreover, the enemies couldn't monitor everything happening on the island as they had jammed all signals within the island. The helicopters are here. Get on board, Shirley said to the man behind her. Let's go together. 
Zacharias reached for her hand and was determined not to leave her behind. However, she had someone else she couldn't leave behind Richard. She took Zacharias' hand. All right, let's go. Then, she and Zacharias boarded one of the helicopters. She swiftly pulled something from a hidden compartment and fastened it around Zachariah's wrist before securing the other end to the frame of the seat. Shirley, what are you doing? Zacharias panicked as he saw her actions. Shirley swiftly delivered a punch to his neck, causing his eyes to widen in shock before he slumped against his seat, succumbing to unconsciousness. Everyone else felt a sting in their necks just witnessing her swift and brutal action. What are you waiting for? Get him out of here. Shirley urged as she exited the helicopter while handing the key to the handcuffs to Freddy. Free him once you're safe. What about you, Miss Lloyd? My father is still here. I can't leave him. Hurry, go. Shirley turned and swiftly dashed into the darkness. At that moment, everyone understood one thing Zachariah's life was the priority, and they had to ensure his safety at all costs. The helicopter rose into the night sky before disappearing quickly. Shirley stood by the shoreline and watched as the helicopter vanished into the distance. She heaved a sigh of relief as she prayed for his safety above all else. Suddenly, two mercenaries emerged from the woods, and each of them was carrying a rocket launcher on their shoulders. They were ready to launch an attack on Zachariah's helicopter. Shirley's pupils contracted sharply as she drew her gun and fired two precise bullets, hitting the targets in a textbook headshot. She lay low in the grass and was prepared to intercept anyone attempting to pursue Zacharias. At that moment, Richard, who had been undercover among the group, had already dealt with six individuals. As he took down the seventh, he was spotted by a mercenary who had mistakenly stumbled upon him while he was doing the deed. The mercenary exclaimed in terror, there's a traitor. Everyone, be on alert. There's a traitor. Then, he dashed away in panic. Richard swiftly drew his dagger before heading in a particular direction the direction leading to the office of the highest authority. Inside, an intense discussion was underway. Just moments ago, they received the news of Zachariah's escape via helicopter. Four men of substantial power were debating the next course of action. Who could have breached this place and saved Zacharias? Why haven't they dealt with him yet? We've shut down all tracking devices and cut off all the signals. So, we can't contact the outside world ourselves. Even if someone has made it here, we won't be able to identify them immediately. Mr. Webb, how did you allow such a big flaw to occur? We trusted you so much, and what did you do with our trust? You've made such a fatal mistake. Does your son's life mean nothing to you? Zane's face turned panicked instantly as he rushed to explain, I assure you that my arrangement is flawless. I gained Zachariah's complete trust in this matter. So, I know for a fact that he doesn't have a single contingency plan. Mr. Webb, none of us will survive this, especially now that your involvement has been exposed as well. You've got all that leverage against Zachariah's, and what have you done with it besides sending us to our doom? Give me another chance. I'll make a new plan to eliminate Zacharias. I swear I'll get it right this time. Do you really think Zacharias will trust you after this? Zane collapsed into a chair while sweating profusely. Of course, Zacharias would never trust him again. Meanwhile, Richard found himself standing outside the door of this office after neutralizing four bodyguards along the way. Then, he rummaged through the bodies and picked up a security card from one of the guards before swiping it to gain entry. The heavy door swung open before revealing the identities of the four men in the meeting directly in front of him. Richard was holding a gun in his hand and was somewhat astonished, these were people he knew and had some rapport with. R. Richard, what are you doing here? One of them pointed at him in disbelief. Richard closed the door, and his gaze was chilly as it swept over the four men. It seems that the masterminds behind the assassination attempt on Mr. Flintstone are the lot of you. Richard, it's a misunderstanding. We were just called here for a meeting. Richard, put the gun down. We're on the same side, one of them tried to approach Richard after speaking. Richard's gun immediately aimed at the person's knee and fired a shot. The loud bang promptly sent shivers down the spines of the other three men. Richard's face was cold and merciless, akin to a raging tiger standing there as he blocked their escape route. 
Richard, calm down. We were forced into this. Please, help us get out of here. Yeah, we were coerced. We're friends, aren't we? Are you saying that you can't trust me? Richard sneered, my duty is to eliminate scum like you. Richard, let us out immediately. Everyone on this island belongs to us. If you don't want to die, release us now. If I feared death, I wouldn't have lived till today. Richard snorted disdainfully. His reputation was well known domestically and internationally. Everyone was well aware of just how he operated. Did you save Zacharias? How could you possibly come here? Where did you get the information? Zane bombarded Richard with questions, both horrified and curious. Richard didn't want to answer that question because the one who had convinced him to come here was his daughter. Honestly, he was glad he caved and made this trip. Meanwhile, Shirley doubled back to rendezvous with Nixon after dealing with a few mercenaries. Gunshots rang out ahead, and the sound prompted her to duck down swiftly. Soon, she witnessed Nixon in a skirmish with a mercenary while their men were also engaged in combat. Hence, she seized the opportunity and shot the enemy in the chest. Nixon was injured as he fell to his knees. He instinctively turned toward the bushes and was surprised to see Shirley. Then, he couldn't help but ask in worry, Miss Lloyd, why did you return? Why didn't you leave? My father and the others are on this island. I can't leave, Shirley replied while helping him up. Have you seen my father? No, we've had no contact with Mr. Lloyd. There are enemy forces scattered all over the island. Let's find a place to hide for now. The other four were also injured. The enemy's firepower was too intense, especially when they were also severely outnumbered. It was quite a miracle that they had managed to survive. It wouldn't be an understatement to say that they had placed their own lives on the line in order to survive. Shirley had already come to realize that not only did the mercenaries outnumber them, but they were also given highly advanced equipment, including heavy weaponry like rocket launchers. There's a rocky reef ahead. We can hide there, Shirley said while supporting them as they hobbled back in the direction they came from. Their movements were somewhat concealed under the cover of night. As a result, it naturally made it difficult for the enemy to track them down. Shirley was concerned for her father. She settled Nixon and the others in a safe place before setting off to find him. Mr. Nixon, stay put. I'll lead these enemy forces away. What? Miss Lloyd, please don't take any unnecessary risks. How can we explain it to Mr. Lloyd if something happens to you? Nixon yelled after her. Of course, Shirley feared death. Still, she dreaded losing someone dear more than losing her own life. Hence, she wasn't about to change her mind to rescue her father. Even if she didn't make it in time, she could at least confirm if he was alive or dead. Her heart was filled with anxiety at this moment. She wouldn't stop advancing into the enemy territory unless she received credible news about her father's condition. Let's go together, Nixon said as he clutched his injured shoulder, pushing himself to his feet. No, I'll go. You all stay hidden here, Shirley replied sternly. She was about to stand up when she suddenly heard a familiar sound in the sky. She instinctively raised her head and saw fighter jets breaking through the clouds as they streaked down like meteors, one after another. Mr. Nixon, look, our reinforcements are here, Shirley pointed as she recognized the scene all too well those were her father's men. Mrs. Lloyd indeed sought help immediately. Nixon sighed while appreciating the depth of their marital bond. Shirley's confidence soared. So, she turned to Nixon. Mr. Nixon, wait for reinforcements to arrive. I'll go ahead. Miss Lloyd, please be careful. Nixon hurriedly cautioned her. Shirley nodded and darted into the nearby bushes. It was impossible to conceal the fact that jets were approaching the area. So, not only did she see the fighter jets streaking down, but the enemy forces also caught sight of them. Fear and apprehension flashed in their eyes, and they started retreating immediately. Shirley followed from a distance while trailing a few of the retreating enemies. She wanted to find out where they were heading. She hoped her father might be among them. Finally, she spotted a brightly lit small base where many mercenaries were rushing in. Shirley chose a different direction and climbed over a wall. Just as she made it from the first floor to the second, she overheard a conversation between two smokers. We're leaving without getting paid. Did we do this for nothing? 
You're still thinking about money at this point. We should prioritize escaping with our lives. Haven't you seen who's coming? That's the special forces. Anyone who encounters them ends up dead. Zacharias escaped. Can we still get paid? We need to hurry to the docks, grab a boat, and get out fast. If we don't make it, forget about the money, we'll lose our lives. Okay, I'll follow your lead. The two quickly left the corridor. Shirley then continued upstairs. She had a feeling her father might be here, and those villains who framed Zacharias were also present. At this moment, the mercenaries were all scrambling toward the docks. Thus, the building was relatively deserted. Richard blocked the doorway, and his gaze was sharp as a knife. He was stopping the four of them. Nevertheless, each of these four individuals was a cunning old fox as their eyes were flickering with thoughts of fleeing the scene. Richard, if you let us go, we'll make sure a large sum of money gets deposited into your account. It'll be an unimaginable figure. I have no interest in your dirty money. Richard remained unmoved. Richard, we can do it the easy way or the hard way. They observed the mercenaries pouring out toward the docks while standing by the floor-to-ceiling window. They exchanged looks and were unsure of what was happening outside. Why were their men heading toward the docks? Nonetheless, they speculated that Zachariah's reinforcements had arrived. If that were the case, they needed to escape this room quickly. Suddenly, Richard and the four men could hear someone banging on the door. It was accompanied by a loud commotion. Come in, one of the old men called out. The person outside immediately swiped a card to enter. Alas, Richard promptly shot and destroyed the circuit, turning the entire room into an enclosed space. The outsiders, who heard the gunshot, realized there was trouble brewing within the room they were here to collect their debts, and their employers were inside. So, they had to rescue those old coots for the sake of their empty wallets. The sounds of pounding and gunshots echoed from outside as the men tried various ways to break through the door. Richard's face was grave as he stood guard at the door with a gun in hand. Richard, you can't hold them off forever. Those outside are after money, not lives. We're the ones offering money. They won't give up on us so easily. I believe you won't kill us either. If you do, you'll bear the blame. The loud commotion grew increasingly rowdy as the sturdy steel door began to creak, causing the adjacent walls to tremble. Stay alert, everyone. Our rescuers are here. These individuals were audacious and had long disregarded the law. Shirley also heard the sounds of multiple people ramming the door. So, she moved toward the source of the noise and intended to open a door. Just as she was about to do so, she heard a voice screaming at the top of their lungs, hurry. Open that door. The ministers are trapped inside, and we need to rescue them if we want to get paid. Is anyone else in there? I don't know. Judging from the gunshot earlier the ministers are being held hostage. So, I'm sure there are enemies inside. Shirley speculated that Richard might be the hostage taker. His objective wasn't just to save Zacharias but also to expose the identities of those crooks orchestrating Zacharias' attempted murder behind the scenes. It was his duty. She clutched her fists tightly and knew she had to rescue her father. Even though reinforcements had arrived, they couldn't immediately breach the area, and time was of the essence. She immediately ran upstairs and arrived at the top floor, where she noticed two thugs attempting to break in through the skylight. They were preparing their tools and were completely unaware of her presence. When they went to get their guns, Shirley swiftly dealt with them. She grabbed the window-breaking tool with one hand and coiled the rope around her hand a few times. Then, she landed gracefully on the glass panel with a leap before balancing on her tiptoes. Sure enough, she saw her father pointing his gun at four individuals through the glass. Richard also caught sight of her. He was surprised and thrilled that she had managed to find him. He watched as his daughter used an iron spike to carve a circle on the glass. Then, she leapt, and her foot landed precisely at the center of the circle. This wasn't ordinary glass. So, one had to be skilled in order to break through the glass. Otherwise, they would be just wasting their time and effort. Richard watched approvingly as his daughter executed her plan. The glass finally shattered after receiving six powerful stomps from her. Shirley protected her face as she rolled and landed on the ground. Shirley, are you okay? Richard asked her. Shirley rose to her feet swiftly. 
I'm fine, dad. There are six people outside, Shirley reported, then turned her gaze toward the four individuals. Her eyes bore into them like they were trash. If she could, she would take them out one by one. These were the people behind the assassination attempt and the very ones she despised. Richard, you've indeed raised a great daughter. Teased one of the men. Shirley instantly pointed her gun at the person. Say another word, and I'll kill you right now. You wouldn't dare to kill me. Your father. The person's smug words were interrupted as Shirley shot his shoulder. She sneered, I'll do what my dad wouldn't. Richard looked on approvingly. There was no doubt about it. Shirley was definitely his daughter. Now, none of the four dared to speak out of turn. Shirley noticed a nearby box. She kicked it open to find a set of handcuffs inside. She grabbed four and approached the individuals. You dare, one of them started to say. She grabbed his shoulder, pressed her foot on his back, and pinned him to the ground before promptly cuffing him. The second person tried to resist and raised a fist to strike her. She simply snorted and landed a punch on his face, which disoriented him. In the next moment, she kicked him against the wall and handcuffed him as well. The third person was terrified. So, he didn't bother struggling. Instead, he meekly extended his hands and allowed Shirley to cuff him. Chapter 2641 The fourth person knew better than to fight against Shirley. So, he darted toward the window and was prepared to jump out for survival. Although it was high, he had a premonition that death was imminent. Alas, how could Shirley possibly allow him to flee? She tripped him with one foot and swiftly handcuffed him to the nearby furniture. I won't give you an easy death. Richard looked at his daughter with pride. It seemed that his daughter had been practicing a great deal lately as her execution seemed more efficient. You little brat, how dare you treat us like this? Shirley sneered, I'm already being kind by treating you this way. I will hand you over to Zacharias and let him deal with you personally. You, the four people were terrified, and their faces turned stark white with pear. Then, Shirley picked up the gun from the ground and said to Richard, Dad, your subordinates have arrived. They will surround this place soon. Shirley's words made the handcuffed officials turn as white as a ghost. Their flawless plan ended up becoming proof of their misdeeds. Bang, bang. The sound of people trying to force the door open outside continued to echo across the meeting room. Judging from the shaking walls and the falling plaster, it seemed that the mercenaries were about to break in. Shirley immediately stood next to her father, intending to face the mercenaries, who were about to break in alongside her father. Finally, the iron door caved in with a loud bang. The two mercenaries who had just broken in couldn't react in time and were promptly dealt with by Richard and Shirley. Just then, one of them suddenly let go of the gun in his hand, and it slid on the smooth floor. It was about to fall into the hands of a minister when Richard rolled over quickly. Just as the minister was about to pick it up, Richard kicked the gun toward his daughter. Shirley crouched down and briskly provided cover for her father. Soon, there was a spray of bullets coming from the door. So, Shirley reached down to pick up the gun from the ground. She held a gun in each hand with a confident and heroic posture. Then, she accurately hit each dodging mercenary on the head. At this moment, a bomb was suddenly tossed in. Shirley and Richard exchanged a glance, and he shouted, Sherry, don't move. After that, he kicked the bomb and sent it flying out of the broken window. It exploded in the air, and they successfully averted the disaster. Just then, there was movement at the window. It seemed that the enemy hoped to hit Thurn with another spray of bullets. Shirley immediately said to her father, Dad, leave that side to me. Be careful, Sherry, Richard said in a deep voice. As Shirley approached the site, she saw a mercenary coming toward the window in a parabolic trajectory. The intense gunfire forced her to roll away in a series of movements. Nonetheless, the moment the man landed, she pounced out from the base of the wall. Then, she didn't hesitate to kick his wrist just as he was about to land, causing the AK-47 in his hand to fly out of his grasp. The next moment, she immediately removed the rifle from his vicinity by kicking it through the shattered window. The man's face twisted into a sinister scowl as he immediately drew two knives from his waist and started to attack Shirley. A dangerous close-quarters combat began. 
Shirley's body was agile and nimble as she evaded the attack smoothly, rendering the brute force of the mercenary useless. Although he was trained and thought he could easily handle a female opponent, there was no denying the fact that he had underestimated her. When the man saw Shirley being forced to the wall, he chuckled mirthlessly, nowhere to hide, huh. Shirley smirked. It's my turn. As the man raised the two knives to stab her, she used the opening to strike at his most vulnerable area. She didn't bother holding back the strength she used in her kick. The man screamed in agony as he swung the knife down. Alas, the girl had disappeared from his line of sight during his inattention. The next moment, she had somehow stolen one of his knives. He could only look on in shock as his throat was slit, spending his last moments as a eunuch. Richard, who had just been sweating in anxiety on the side, breathed a sigh of relief. Although he knew his daughter was skilled and often sparred with his subordinates, facing such a fierce enemy was an entirely different matter. So, he felt himself uncoiling from his burst of anxiety after witnessing his daughter's capabilities firsthand. Indeed, the battlefield proved to be the best place to test his daughter. His training had not been in vain, and he believed his daughter could protect herself well. Moreover, the ferociousness she displayed when taking lives resembled himself in his younger days swift, ruthless, and without a hint of hesitation. The several ministers on the side were sweating profusely, as they witnessed the scene playing before them. They had once considered sending people to kidnap and deal with Shirley to hinder Zacharias. They truly didn't expect that she would turn out to be such a formidable opponent. Shirley's performance today exceeded her usual standards. Why? Because there was a fierce determination in her that was fueled by the thought of these people attempting to harm Zacharias. They were her enemies, and what they did was unforgivable. Therefore, they would have to pay the price for their actions. Meanwhile, the gunfire outside continued relentlessly. When she noticed this, she couldn't help but say to her father, Dad, I'll go over from the rooftop. Sherry, Richard wanted to stop her from going alone. Alas, she had already grabbed the rope she had brought down with her. Then, she swung from the window and climbed up the rope. He could only hold his ground to prevent the enemy from breaking in because these four individuals had to survive this ordeal. He had to ensure that they would be tried in court. If they died, there wouldn't be a day of peace as the enemy's hiding in the shadows would fail to be eradicated. Shirley arrived at the rooftop, picked up an AK-47 lying on the ground, and shoved the door open confidently. She was like a fearless Valkyrie straight out of a game. The number of mercenaries had increased from six to over a dozen. They were all here for the money. Some had seized the opportunity to flee with their lives. Nonetheless, others were determined to get the money even at the cost of their lives. They had to rescue the captured ministers. As soon as Shirley descended the stairs, she encountered a mercenary. Both opened fire almost simultaneously. A bullet grazed her shoulder, leaving a bloody trail. Her aim struck true as the other paid with his life. She glanced at the bloodstain on her shoulder, gritted her teeth, and continued walking. Someone had rushed over after hearing gunshots. So, she slipped into a corner and ambushed them, taking down two individuals instantly. At that moment, Shirley heard the sound of the main force arriving downstairs, and she immediately breathed a sigh of relief the reinforcements had finally arrived. The mercenaries naturally heard it and soon became restless like ants on a hot pan. They were preparing to escape. Unfortunately, they had to go up the rooftop if they wanted to flee, and Shirley had already predicted their decision. So, she quickly made her way to the rooftop, chose an optimal shooting position, and started sniping the remaining mercenaries. Her actions and perfect aim forced those hired guns into a desperate situation. On the other hand, the special forces had already arrived at Richard's position upstairs. A decisive battle against the enemy was nearing its end. As the last one was gunned down, the entire building was cleared of potential enemies. Richard watched his daughter appear before noticing the wound on her shoulder. He rushed toward her. Where are you injured? Let me have a look. Dad, it's just a graze from a bullet. It's no big deal, Shirley said with a faint smile. Richard breathed a sigh of relief and gave her a thumbs up. Your performance today was excellent, but don't tell your mother. She instantly beamed brightly, don't worry. I won't let mom know about all this. Mr. 
Lloyd, the helicopter is at the entrance. You should leave first. Sherry, you go on ahead. I think Zacharias is probably losing his mind with worry. I'll stay behind to escort these people into a jail cell, Richard said as he was concerned about these four individuals. He wasn't about to let these scum leave his sight. Okay, Dad, Shirley nodded. The events of tonight had come to an end, and it was time for her to check on the unconscious man. Nevertheless, she was hoping that he wouldn't be too mad that she had knocked him out. Shirley boarded the helicopter and looked down from the aircraft at the island shrouded in darkness. The island seemed to emit an aura of death and carried an ominous vibe. Zacharias was brought into the hospital. The punch from Shirley had knocked him out cold. He only managed to wake up and regain his bearings as the lights in the emergency room turned on. The first thing he said upon waking up was, Sherry. He sat up abruptly. When he saw the bewildered doctor beside him, he immediately pushed himself off the hospital bed, pulled the door open, and went out. When he saw Freddy outside, he demanded harshly, where is she? Miss Lloyd is still on the island. Get me there. Now, Zacharias anxiously grabbed Freddy's hand. Arrange a helicopter for me. Mr. Flintstone, the situation on the island is unclear, and the situation is not under control. You cannot return to the island at this time. Freddy advised firmly. Fine, I'll get there by myself. After that, Zacharias promptly dashed out of the hospital. Mr. Flintstone. Mr. Flintstone, Freddy immediately chased after him. Just then, Freddy's phone started ringing. He whisked it out, looked at the screen, and was pleasantly surprised. Mr. Flintstone, Miss Lloyd is calling. Zacharias immediately spun on his heel upon hearing Freddy's words before snatching Freddy's phone and answering it eagerly, Hello, Sherry. Is it you? It's me. I'm fine. Don't worry. Shirley's voice came through. Zacharias instantly breathed a sigh of relief. It's good as long as you're okay. Where are you? I'm on the helicopter, heading toward the first military hospital. Are you injured? Zacharias' heart clenched at the thought. It's just superficial wounds. Okay, I'll wait for you. He suppressed his almost frantic emotions while waiting for her to arrive. Okay, she hung up the phone. Zacharias handed the phone back to Freddy. It was only then that he realized that his neck was still sore. He rubbed it gently as he recalled Shirley's actions that had knocked him out cold. He closed his eyes as a surge of anger rushed through his veins. His frustration was not because she hit him but because she sent him away. He was upset because she had gone to such lengths alone and without backup. An hour later, a helicopter landed on the helipad outside the hospital. Shirley stepped down from the helicopter, and the man, who had been eagerly waiting for her, rushed toward her. The wind tousled her hair, causing her to look rather disheveled. Still, her face remained as beautiful as a rose. Although she looked like a mess, she was as gorgeous as ever. The man opened his arms and didn't hesitate to embrace her tightly. Ouch! Shirley immediately exclaimed in pain as he had accidentally tugged on her injury while hugging her. She hadn't felt any pain from the wound throughout her flight. Yet, her pain receptors started working overtime the moment she was right before this man. It seemed that it was true that one tended to display a certain amount of vulnerability only before the person they trusted and loved. Zacharias immediately released her. Only then did he realize that there was a wet spot on her shoulder. He tentatively reached out to touch it, and his hand came away from her black sweater stained with blood. My shoulder was grazed by a bullet, Shirley said softly. Zacharias held her hand. Let's go to the emergency room. Shirley removed her sweater and revealed the injured area inside the private emergency room. The scorching bullet had left her with some burns. As she took a closer look, she learned that the wound was actually quite deep. Zachariah's heart instantly ached, and his eyes moistened at the sight. It had to have been several hours since she got this wound. Yet, she had been fighting with this injury all this while. A nurse approached Shirley to help her clean the wound. Nonetheless, Zacharias swiftly took the antiseptic solution from the nurse's hands. Then, he gently poured some onto the wound, causing Shirley's eyebrows to twitch slightly. She was displaying an extraordinary pain tolerance. If it hurts, just say so, Zacharias said in a hoarse voice. He wished he could transfer this wound to himself. 
I'm not that delicate, said Shirley as she raised her head proudly. He continued cleaning her wound seriously. She felt a little guilty and murmured, does your neck still hurt? How dare you hit me? You've got quite the nerve. I'll punish you to stay by my side for the rest of your life, and you're not allowed to leave. Zacharias snorted. She accepted the punishment willingly. Okay. He carefully applied medication and bandaged her wound. Shirley was only wearing a sports bra at the moment. However, there was only concern and tenderness in his gaze. He brought a basin of hot water and began to wipe her body clean once he was done dressing her wound. She sat there, thoroughly enjoying his service. My father has those four masterminds under his custody. Don't you dare spare them, Shirley said solemnly. Zachariah's eyes revealed intense murderous intent. I will make them regret living in this world. Although his tone was harsh and his words were cruel, his actions were still gentle. Shirley couldn't help but find this man utterly irresistible. The bandaging was finally done, but Shirley's clothes were already stained with blood, so she couldn't wear them anymore. The man removed the cardigan he was wearing and put it on her. She instantly warmed up under the thick and warm material, but the man was only wearing a thin, white button down underneath. This night seemed slow and long, and after Shirley returned to the Flintstone residence with Zacharias and informed her mother that she was home safely, she rested in his embrace, feeling exhausted. Forgetting how her hands were stained with blood while killing a person this evening, she drifted off to sleep peacefully. On the other hand, Zacharias was sleepless. Propping himself with one arm, he stared at the girl in his arms with a mix of emotions in his chest self-blame, heartbrokenness, and a strong feeling of love. She loved him more than her life. Lowering his head, he planted a kiss on her forehead. I love you more than my life, too. When sunlight once again poured over the land the next day, the world seemed so beautiful and peaceful. Dressed in her night robe, Shirley was at the staircase landing on the second floor when the delicious smell of breakfast drifted to her nose, and she went downstairs, following the trail of the aroma. Then, she found Zacharias cooking in the kitchen because the cook wasn't on duty today. After approaching him, she hugged him around the waist from behind and rested her head on his shoulder. Zacharias spun around and kissed her on the top of her head. Why don't you head over to the dining table first? Breakfast will be ready soon. A smile spread across her face. It's my honor to have breakfast made by you. As long as you like it, I'll prepare breakfast for you all my life, he replied, turning his head back. However, Shirley shook her head. It's enough every once in a while. You have more important matters to attend to. As she was fully aware of the responsibilities and missions he had, she wouldn't take up his time. Besides loving her, he needed to love his country more. After breakfast, she received a call from her mother. This afternoon, they were invited to lunch at the White House, and she would be attending with Zacharias. We're going to my granduncle's place for lunch today, she said to Zacharias after hanging up. Zacharias nodded. Okay, I didn't even get to meet your father last night. It's great that I can use this opportunity to meet him now. We're not going to talk about work when we're there. We'll just enjoy our lunch together. Sure, we can also discuss our marriage with your family, he added, placing his hands around her waist. Are you willing to be Mrs. Flintstone? Lifting her head, she asked, are there any benefits to being Mrs. Flintstone? Squinting his eyes, he thought about it and lowered his head, asking, I'll love you my whole life. Is that considered a benefit? She nodded. Yes, it is. Avoiding her injured shoulder, he held her around her waist, leaned in, and took her lips. Naturally, she returned the kiss. Ahem. An out-of-place voice echoed just then, and Freddy showed up with an urgent document in his hand. Mr. Zacharias, your signature is required for this urgent document. Looks like you're giving up on your bonus this month, Zacharias grumbled. Chuckling, Shirley whacked him gently. You're not allowed to cut his bonus. He's just doing his job. Feeling grateful, Freddie thought, thankfully, Miss Lloyd is sensible. At the grand lobby of the White House, Shirley and Zacharias saw that her parents had arrived before them. Judging from her mother's face as she spoke to her grandaunt, Shirley knew that her mother had no idea about anything that happened last night. A tacit agreement had already been established between her and her father a long time ago, 
As long as it was anything dangerous, they would hide it from her mother to avoid making her worried. Zack, come and join us for a cup of tea upstairs. Richard invited. Given the situation, he didn't address him according to his status but treated him as his son-in-law. In response, Zacharias gave him a nod and went upstairs with him after meeting Shirley's eyes for a second. While the men were discussing work, Shirley stayed by her mother's side for a casual conversation. What a perfect match Shirley and Zach are. I think they're a match made in heaven. As the first lady, Ruka was very friendly. Looks like I have good judgment, and Shirley is a lucky girl. Angela approved of Zacharias. On the other hand, Shirley was a little embarrassed. The entire country had heard about the rumor between her and Zacharias a long time ago, and today, while scrolling her phone out of boredom in the car, she found out that the internet already regarded her as Zachariah's wife and even gave her the title of Mrs. Flintstone. Moreover, there was also a video clip of her walking into an evening banquet while holding Zachariah's arm. Even when she watched it again, she felt that she and Zachariah's looked great together. I was so worried last night that I could barely sleep because I thought that something bad had cropped up on the island, Angela said, turning to her daughter. Your dad said that they only apprehended a few criminals. Nothing else happened, right? Shirley nodded. Yes, he's right that nothing happened. Nonetheless, the injury on her shoulder was still fresh. Feeling a little guilty for lying, she shifted her shoulder to the side discreetly and tried to maintain a natural appearance. That's great. It's Christmas tomorrow. Let's spend it happily by having a meal together and welcoming the new year. Before lunch, the three men came downstairs, appearing more at ease since they had finished their discussion. At the dining table, Zacharias and Shirley sat together, and the former offered drinks to his future parents-in-law, showing respect to them like they were his elders. I think it's better not to delay Zach and Shirley's wedding any longer. After this, he will need her to accompany him to all the functions he'll be attending, Wren said, starting the conversation. As the elder and president, it made full sense that he took charge of this matter. Uncle Wren, why don't you pick a date for them? Suggested Richard. Let's hold the wedding two weeks from now. It will be a private wedding without being too lavish. I'm sorry to Shirley about this, Wren said. After hearing this, Shirley immediately exclaimed, No, that's fine. This is exactly what I want. We should keep it as private as possible. Surely, we shouldn't keep it so low profile either, Zacharias said with a smile, worried that she would feel neglected. Let's ask Joseph out for dinner tonight and set the date, Richard suggested. We won't be joining tonight. Please go ahead, Wren said with a chuckle, as he had other matters to attend to. Okay, Mr. Lloyd, Zacharias immediately agreed. I'll prepare the food and drinks at home tonight. Please come to my place for dinner. Richard nodded. Great. Both families will meet, then. After lunch, Zacharias had to leave because of work, and Shirley stayed with her mother until evening to attend the dinner at the Flintstone residence. In the evening, the dining table at the Flintstones was covered with food for a banquet. Joseph was excited to finally live to the day of his son's wedding. As they often met each other in the political scene, they got along quite well and chatted like family when they sat together. In the end, they decided to hold a private wedding ceremony in two weeks. The invitations would be sent out the next day, and the guests were all their internal staff. Naturally, Richard immediately informed his two best friends, asking them to make time and bring their families to attend his daughter's wedding. At night, Shirley's phone rang. It was a call from Willow, who was far away. Hello, Willow, she answered, picking up the phone. I would have never guessed you'd get married first. Congratulations, Willow said, sending her blessings. I didn't think it would turn out this way either. When I met you the last time, I didn't even have a boyfriend yet. Fate works in mysterious ways. It catches up to you while you are unaware, Willow said with a sigh. Shirley agreed with what she said. When she first met Zacharias, the last thing she imagined was becoming this man's wife one day. Recalling their first meeting, she would have never dared to imagine such a thing happening. Willow, you have to attend my wedding, okay? I most certainly will, Willow promised. At night, Shirley swept her long hair to one side as the man gently examined her injury. Should we postpone the wedding? 
He asked in a heartbroken voice. Your injury has yet to heal. Shirley shook her head. No, let's not do that. I want to marry you. Zacharias leaned down and nibbled her neck. I can't wait to marry you and make you my wife. Shirley spun around and looked deep into his eyes, which were as calm as the sea. His eyes accepted everything that she was, and they were filled with love and enchantment. Zacharias planted a kiss on her forehead, filling her with satisfaction. Meanwhile, after Richard informed everyone else of the wedding, he gave Arthur a call. He was always abroad, and both of their schedules were full, so it wasn't easy for them to meet often. Hey Artie, how are you? I'm good. Are you calling to inform me of the good news, Richard? My daughter is getting married in two weeks, and I would like to invite you to the wedding. I'm sorry, Richard. The vice president of Lochrist is coming in a few days, and I can't leave because I'll be taking him around. May I ask that my son attend it in my stead? Once our discussion is over, I'll come over right away, Arthur said, sounding apologetic. Richard laughed heartily. That's fine. You don't have to feel apologetic. We can meet up any time. It's been a while since I saw your son, and this will be a good opportunity to meet him again. I'll make sure he arrives on time. Once I'm finished with work, I'll come and meet you immediately for some drinks. Don't forget to bring your wife along, all right? I haven't seen her for such a long time as well. Sure, it's time we meet and have a good catch-up. Arthur agreed with a laugh. The good friends chatted on the phone for about 15 minutes. Shortly after, in the faraway Weiss estate located in Floor, someone received a call from the other side of the world. A certain young master on vacation there answered the phone. Hi, Dad. Attend the Lloyd family's wedding on my behalf. Who's getting married? Richard's daughter is getting married in two weeks. Go over right away and don't be late. Your mother and I will join you afterward. I got it. I'll head over ahead of time, Dad. A yacht stood still in the middle of the sea. Laying on the deck was a man in a white shirt, sunnies, and casual beach shorts. The sunlight poured over his sculptured face and fair skin, which gave him a regal glow. Head back to the port, he instructed the bodyguard on duty. Then, he rose to his feet, standing tall at six feet two. The first three buttons on his shirt were casually left unbuttoned, which unintentionally revealed his chest muscles, and his long legs were especially toned and strong. After holding the reins of Weiss Empire for three years, he had developed a strong and dominant aura, and every move he made was suave and elegant. The young master of the Weiss family, Ezekiel Weiss, was the only son in his family and had grown up to be a muscular hunk. At the age of 27, he was at his peak, bright and blazing like the sun at 10 a.m. The next day, a private jet flew into Zoravia's airspace. The cabin crew on board carefully attended to the young master. There were quite a few admirers among them, and even though they tried to display their charm, no one could catch the attention of the young master on the leather seat. It was a long-haul flight, but their chances were limited. If they were lucky enough to grab his attention, they could have a share of his wealth and wouldn't have to worry about their livelihood anymore, even if they couldn't marry him. In addition, anyone would be willing to date such a man for free. Reaching out, Ezekiel picked up his coffee. The thought of returning to his mother's home country and meeting his grandparents delighted him and filled him with anticipation. He had a lot of affection for this country, and it felt like going home. After 28 hours of flying and traveling around half the globe with his private jet, he finally landed safely. His bodyguard deftly grabbed his luggage and put a warm coat on him the moment he left the airport. His car could be transported all over the world, so four dashing SUVs drove over in a row. While Ezekiel was standing still and waiting, he felt a dark shadow lunging at him all of a sudden, which was followed by a girl's surprised yelp. Ah! Out of reflex, he extended his hands and caught the girl who was falling into his arms in a parabola. Her face crashed into his chest strongly, and her slender arms clung to his waist. In response, he hugged the girl who had fallen into his embrace. Ezekiel was stunned, and his bodyguard hadn't realized what was happening yet, but some girl was hugging his young master tightly. On the other hand, the girl hadn't done this on purpose, she was running away from several people. Right after she left the airport, she ran too fast and tripped over her own feet. 
As she stumbled, she bumped right into the man waiting at the airport entrance and hugged him to break her fall. I'm sorry, sir. It's my fault. Wearing a mask, the girl had covered herself so well that only her eyes could be seen. In a black shirt and black pants, only her bright, charming eyes akin to sparkling stars were exposed. However, one could easily tell that she had just cried. Ezekiel couldn't help but be stunned by those eyes. Never had he seen such sad eyes before, which inexplicably evoked his pity. She's over there. With a cry of surprise, a group of people rushed out of the airport. All of them were young girls, and each held their cell phones in their hands, aiming and taking pictures of the figure running away. Bewildered, Ezekiel turned his head in that direction, and his bodyguard stepped in front to protect him, asking in concern, Are you okay, Mr. Weiss? I'm fine, Ezekiel answered, his eyes following the black figure. He watched as she fled in panic and looked backward in a fluster as though she was looking for something. Finally, she climbed into a black MPV, but the group of girls surrounded the car and continued filming. Looking away, Ezekiel suddenly felt something on his chest and reached into his lapel to feel around. To his surprise, he found a gemstone. With a frown, he examined it and thought that it was real. When he held it in his hand, it exuded a cool sensation. Scrutinizing it under the sunlight, he realized that it was indeed a genuine gemstone that had fallen off something. Does this belong to the girl earlier? Holding the gemstone in his palm, he recalled that pair of eyes and smirked as though something interesting was about to happen. Let's get into the car, Mr. Weiss. The bodyguard had already opened the door and was waiting for him. Without further ado, Ezekiel climbed into the car and saw the overreacting girl surrounding the black MPV. Judging from their fervent reaction, he reckoned that the girl who bumped into him earlier was probably a trending celebrity. Meanwhile, the girl in the car didn't feel idolized when she looked at her fervent fans. Instead, she felt suffocated. Her manager couldn't stop herself from berating the girl, asking, why did you return to the country in secret? You didn't even inform me about it, and you're still shooting a commercial. Don't you know that the compensation is three times more, my dear lady? Clutching her manager's hand, she asked miserably, Sarah, tell me if it's true that they are dating each other. Are the pictures on the internet real? Glancing at her, Sarah said calmly, you probably know the answer. Why even bother asking? As the girl bit her red lips, the tears that welled up in her eyes broke free and streamed down her pretty face. Despite flying for hours and the tiredness apparent on her face, it didn't affect her natural beauty but added a touch of delicate attractiveness instead. Don't get mad over such a person. It's not worth it. Isn't it great to be pretty and single? You're now an A-lister, and you can get any kind of man that you want. Sarah comforted her. Furthermore, Catalina Martin comes from a wealthy family with a strong backer, making her a typical product of nepotism. How can you compete with her? Also, you snagged her commercial last time, remember? It's not surprising that she's after your boyfriend now. Is this a reason to betray me? After speaking, Harmony Mayo bit her lip and gritted her teeth, hissing, I must find a man ten times better than him and make him realize that I'm not too shabby at all. That's the way to go. That's how you should think. Sarah praised. A second later, she realized that the necklace around Harmony's neck had an empty bracket, and the diamond on it was missing. Where's the diamond on your necklace? She asked worriedly. Harmony lowered her head and took a look, and her mind went into shock. Where's the diamond? That diamond belongs to the company that hired me to be their ambassador, and it cost 15 million. They stared at each other blankly for a few seconds, and Harmony immediately said, I still had it when I ran out of the airport and was holding it in my palm. Did it? What happened, my dear girl? Check if it's somewhere on you. Sarah was on the brink of insanity. Immediately, Harmony removed her jacket and checked it. Upon closing her eyes, she said, I must have accidentally dropped the diamond on the guy when I bumped into him earlier. Her gut feeling told her that it must have fallen on the guy when they came into contact. At the same time, Ezekiel's car rolled into the seven-star hotel owned by the Manson Group. After he arrived, he changed into sportswear and headed for the gym. After such a long flight, he was itching for an intense workout. 
The regality he exuded was strong, and right after he stepped into the gym, he became the center of attention. The ladies looked at him with a sparkle in their eyes as though he was a god, and a few of them were already secretly planning to approach him. Although he noticed the attention, he didn't think much of it since nothing was more interesting to him than the workout equipment. While he was working out, the women gulped at the sight of his bursts of strength, which was showing through his sportswear. His figure was considered top-notch, every body part was adequately proportioned, and he had the perfect figure in those women's eyes. Hey, are you training alone? I'm by myself, too. Let's work out together, shall we? No thanks. Lifting his head, Ezekiel spoke Zorvik flawlessly, he didn't have a foreign accent at all. In addition, his voice was deep and attractive. It's boring to be alone. Why not let me accompany you? The girl said, continuing to pester him. She didn't want to let the other girls have any opportunity since she thought that she was the prettiest girl with the best figure in the room. When she blocked the fitness equipment that he needed, he furrowed his brows and said coldly, please move aside. Stepping aside unwillingly, she flipped her long hair and said, shall we grab a cup of coffee together later? My treat. However, Ezekiel turned her down again. No thanks. He was polite, but at the same time, his tone was aloof, sending an unfriendly and unapproachable signal to strangers. Even though this girl already noticed that he was uninterested, she refused to give up. Hey, why don't you give me your number? When you're available, let's. Johnson's, Ezekiel shouted at the door. Soon, two brawny bodyguards carrying a murderous air around them burst in and stood beside him, blocking anyone who wanted to approach him. It wasn't the first or second time that Ezekiel needed bodyguards in the gym. He just wanted to exercise, but some ignorant girls would always pester him. As such, he had to call for his bodyguards. They'd protect him from the girls who tried to strike up a conversation with him. This girl blushed at the sight of the bodyguards and stepped back in embarrassment before picking up her towel awkwardly and leaving. The other girls who wanted to strike up a conversation with him dropped the idea as well. Nevertheless, they wondered curiously who this man could be and why he brought bodyguards with him to the gym. No matter who he was, this man gave a sense of regality on sight, so he must be some rich man's son. Unfortunately, they didn't have a chance to get to know him. At the airport, Sarah finally found a connection after using all her means, and she checked the surveillance footage at the airport entrance. If the lost diamond couldn't be found, not only would her company go bankrupt after compensation, but all the celebrities that she had nurtured would be thrown under the bus as well. Chapter 2651 Sarah went to the surveillance room and watched how her talent, Harmony, stumbled into a man's embrace. After their brief encounter, Harmony ran away when her fans chased after her. In the surveillance, the man lowered his head and found something. A few seconds later, he was seen holding a gemstone in his hand as he examined it. That's the gemstone my talent lost. I finally found it. So, this gentleman found it. Sarah breathed in relief, everything was easier since the stone was found. Now, all she had to do was ask the man in the surveillance footage to return the gemstone. Armed with this evidence, she was confident she could retrieve the gemstone. The only snag was that she had no clue how to track down the man. After seeking help from various contacts, she eventually ended up back at the police station. Even though she didn't officially file a report, the police assisted her in obtaining information about the man. When Sarah got the address of the hotel that he checked into, she mumbled, Ezekiel Weiss, a guest at Presidential Suite 8888. Looks like he's a big shot. How can we get back the diamond? In the apartment, the girl on the couch was holding an iPad. As she looked at the pictures of a couple holding hands and kissing, tears flowed down her face uncontrollably. The man in the pictures was her boyfriend since she joined acting school. They had worked hard together, keeping their relationship a secret. She thought that once she had earned enough, she could hold his hand on stage and publicly announce their relationship. After clinching the Best Actress Award at the Golden Rose Award and seeing her career soar, she discovered her boyfriend was secretly dating a wealthy celebrity. He was even caught in an intimate act with the other girl in a parking lot by the paparazzi. 
In the midst of filming an advertisement abroad, she hastily returned home without weighing the consequences. Unfortunately, trouble didn't come alone, and she even misplaced the gemstone used during the shoot. The cell phone next to Harmony rang, and she quickly glanced at it. Upon seeing that it was a call from her manager, she hurriedly picked it up. Hello. Did you find it, Sarah? I did. It fell onto the clothes of the man you accidentally bumped into. I've got the hotel address where he's staying. You should swing by tonight and retrieve the gemstone from him. It just doesn't feel right if I go, Sarah said. Okay, I'll look for him at his hotel, Harmony replied. After the call, her cell phone rang again. It was an unknown number, but she picked it up anyway. Hello, who's calling? It's me, Harmony. I called to warn you to stay away from my boyfriend. Ruben and I are seeing each other now. The smugness and arrogance in Catalina's voice was obvious. You, Harmony's chest filled with anger, and she was at a loss for words to retort back at her. Oh, here's another tidbit for you. Ruben actually made the first move to win me over, and it turns out he's my type, so we started dating naturally. Just thought it's fair play, you know, considering you took my endorsement and all. Catalina added and hung up after laughing in glee. Damn it, Harmony muttered, biting her lip and clenching her fists in frustration. Twenty minutes later, Sarah returned and showed her the surveillance footage. Look, this gentleman found the diamond. With this surveillance as evidence, I'm confident that he will return it. Harmony took a look at the man who found the diamond, feeling like she was in the dumps. Do I have to approach him tonight to get it back? Miss Mayo, this is an urgent matter. You have no idea how I almost broke my legs running around and asking for favors because of this matter. No matter how bad you're feeling right now, you must pull your socks up and get back the gemstone. After telling her off, Sarah took another look at the man in the surveillance and exclaimed in surprise, wow, he's perfect to be a celebrity. She paused the video, and the man's handsomely sculptured face was on the screen. Even though the image was a little grainy, they could still tell that he was a stunning man. Goodness, this is totally the face for a male lead. If I can get him to be a talent under my wing, I have nothing to worry about anymore. She exclaimed, her eyes glued on the screen. Harmony, when you meet him tonight, can you do me a favor and check if he'd be interested in trying acting? I'm totally open to offering him a sweet deal. Sarah had already started planning to get the man under her wing. Turning to take a look at the man in the surveillance, Harmony nodded. Sure, I'll ask him for you. Catalina rang me up earlier. What did she say? Did she call to show off or protest? Sarah asked. She called to warn me to stay away from Ruben. After speaking, Harmony felt a sting at her nose. Five years. We've been together for five whole years. I hate to say it, but his accomplishments don't quite measure up to yours. So, he's definitely looking for something that can boost him. In this industry, it's all about self-interest. If you can't give it to him, he'll get it from someone else, Sarah pointed out. Harmony closed her eyes, and tears welled up at the corners. No one would be thrilled about falling out of love, especially after a five-year relationship. Suddenly, she found herself adrift, losing the purpose behind her hard work and feeling completely lost in life. It was like all her efforts had become meaningless. All right, stop brooding over this. The important thing now is to get back the gemstone. What's the point of wanting a man who doesn't treasure you? Sarah checked out the man on her screen again, the desire to contract him growing stronger with every passing second. Around 3 p.m., Ezekiel gave Jared a call, sharing that he was back in town. Jared, excited to hear the news, extended an invitation for dinner at his place. Since Ezekiel was representing his father, Arthur, he had to catch up not only with his friends but also with his father's social circle. Arthur had a tight-knit bond within a triangular relationship, and Ezekiel, being his son, naturally shared in those connections. Despite the unusual setup, they had managed to form strong friendships, and whenever they found themselves in the same city, they made it a point to meet up. At 8 p.m. in the Seven Star Hotel, Harmony walked up to the front desk and inquired, Hey, I'm looking for a guest in room 8888. Could you please give him a call for me? 
I'm sorry, miss, but he's our most valued guest, and we wouldn't want to disturb him without a valid reason, the receptionist replied politely. I lost something, and he happened to pick it up. Will you please make an exception? Harmony pleased sincerely. I'd love to assist, but it's the hotel policy, the receptionist declined with a friendly smile. She recalled the guest in room 8888 a charismatic and affluent gentleman. It surprised her how swiftly a woman had arrived looking for him. As part of the hotel staff, it was her responsibility to handle these unexpected visitors on his behalf. May I ask if there's any other way where I can meet him? Harmony asked. I'm sorry, we can't disclose any information about our guests. May I look for him, then? Sorry, but the floor with the presidential suite is restricted to hotel guests. You'll need an access card to get in. Harmony sighed and thanked the receptionist before returning to Sarah's side. The hotel is pretty strict about guest privacy. They won't let me look for him, and he's in the presidential suite, which is off limits for us, Harmony explained. The breakup had really knocked the wind out of her sails. At that moment, Harmony abruptly spotted a man and jumped to her feet, her eyes widening like golf balls. Sarah also caught sight of the man and couldn't help but think, isn't that Reuben, Harmony's ex? Looks like he's staying in this hotel, too. Meanwhile, Harmony felt her heart in turmoil. She wished to call out to him, but he seemed on the verge of leaving. Suddenly, a thought hit Sarah, and she quickly caught up with him. She said, Hey, Reuben. What a surprise. Are you staying here, too? Guilt flashed past Reuben's face when he turned his head and saw that it was Sarah. Hi, Sarah. However, he didn't notice that Harmony was also on the couch in the lobby. Which floor are you staying on? I'm staying in room 8083. Could you get to the level where the presidential suite is? Yes. Sarah couldn't help but let out a sigh of relief at Reuben's response. Finally, she had a way to reach the upper floors. All they needed was to get to the level with the presidential suite and knock on that guest's door. However, when she turned around, Harmony was nowhere to be found. Sarah quickly said, Reuben, you go up first. I'll find you in a bit. Reuben nodded. His status changed after being with Catalina. Since then, the company had assigned him a luxury watch advertisement, causing his worth and reputation to surge instantly. What's more, the suite he was at was also arranged by the advertising company to conduct business negotiations. Sarah hurriedly exited the hotel and immediately saw Harmony standing by the fountain, so she quickly caught up to the latter. Harmony, I have good news for you. Reuben is staying on the presidential suite floor. We can ask him to scan his access card and take you to find the guest in room 8888. I don't want to see him. Harmony shook her head, tears welling up uncontrollably. Don't be stubborn, we haven't taken back the gemstone yet. Sarah urged, what if that guy leaves tomorrow? How could we possibly find him then? If he goes to another country, we'll have no options left. Let's get the gemstone back before the advertising company finds out. Harmony took a deep breath. She loathed the man yet still had to ask for his help. In the meantime, four black SUVs assertively drove into the underground passage next to the flower bed. The man sitting in the car had just returned after having dinner at the Presgrave residence. Let's go. There's no other way. We can only ask Reuben for help. There are no reporters or media here, so just ask him to take you upstairs. It will only take ten minutes. Sarah grabbed her phone as she spoke and called Reuben. Hey, Reuben. I need your help. Could you come to the lobby and take someone up to the presidential suite floor for me? Great. We'll wait for you. Sarah smiled and then forcefully dragged Harmony into the lobby. When Reuben came over from the elevator, he felt his heart skip a huge beat. Looking at the slender and beautiful figure under the light, he felt guilty yet helpless. While he loved Harmony, he had chosen to betray his love for his ambition and resources. Harmony, why are you here? He asked softly. Harmony, be good and go upstairs with Reuben, Sarah persuaded while gently pushing Harmony. However, Harmony remained unmoved, so Sarah could only threaten in a low voice, if we don't get that gemstone, we'll face bankruptcy. Hurry up. After taking a deep breath, Harmony turned to Reuben and said, please take me to the presidential suite floor. Thank you. 
W. Why do you want to go there? I have an appointment with that guest. She walked toward the direction of the elevator. Behind her, Reuben hurriedly caught up with Harmony, asking, who's the guest? She remained silent, and he scanned his access card in the elevator before pressing the button for the 88th floor. Harmony, tell me, who did you make an appointment with? Since you abandoned me for a better opportunity, I can do the same to you. The client I have an appointment with tonight is my benefactor. D. Did you offer yourself to someone? Reuben clenched his fists in anger as though Harmony had initially belonged to him. On the other hand, she pushed aside her pride just to exact full retaliation against her betrayer. She smiled and nodded. Yes, I willingly offered myself to him. So, what? Why do you even care? Later, a ding was heard as the elevator arrived on their floor. As this was a seven-star hotel with top-notch elevators, it only took them seconds to reach their destination. As she was about to get out, he grabbed her hand. Annoyed, she quickly pulled away, scolding, don't touch me. You disgust me. He also knew he had no right to stop her, but deep down, he still loved her. He dated Catalina on a whim to get what he wanted but had no feelings for her. It was just for mutual benefit. Raising her head, Harmony searched for room 8888 and paid no attention to Reuben, who was instinctively trailing behind her. Stop following me. I don't need you to meddle in my business, she scoffed. Thinking about the video and photos of him and Catalina in the basement garage lot, she felt like her world had collapsed. The man she had loved for five years passionately kissing another woman in the garage was more devastating than being slapped several times. At this moment, Harmony stood at the door of room 8888 with Reuben keeping a close eye on her from behind. That resulted in her having no choice but to pretend that she was here to sell herself. Although she was afraid to knock on the door and had no idea what kind of person was inside, she felt like there was a force pushing her, compelling her to go through with this. Secretly taking a deep breath, she rang the doorbell. In the meantime, Reuben's fists were already clenched tightly. He was eager to find out who her benefactor was, curious about their appearance and status in the entertainment industry. At the same time, he couldn't help but imagine that the person might be an older or perhaps a wealthy yet ordinary looking man. Either way, the idea of the woman he'd held dear for five years sharing that intimate moment for the first time was like a painful stab to his heart. Harmony's mind was in a mess because she knew the words she had just spoken to the SC asterisk MBAG on the phone had deeply hurt him. But what if the man inside opened the door and asked who she was? Wouldn't that expose her? Then, she would end up being nothing more than a joke. How she hoped the man inside the room wouldn't say anything when he opened the door. That way, they could at least pretend to know each other when she entered the door and prevent the SC asterisk MBAG from watching her make a fool of herself. On the other hand, Ezekiel had just returned to the hotel, taking off his coat and unbuttoning his shirt. Just as he was about to sit down for a glass of red wine and relax, he heard his doorbell ringing. Intrigued, he pondered who might be seeking him out at this hour and approached the door. When he looked through the peephole and saw a young woman standing outside, he nearly forgot he had a gemstone that he had found. It seemed like the owner had found him. A faint smile played on his lips, finding it quite interesting. The image of the tearful eyes that he saw at the airport flashed through his mind. There seemed to be a mysterious force tugging him, making him eager to know the story behind those teary eyes. So, he reached out and twisted the doorknob, swinging the door open. Outside the door, Harmony and Reuben stood in stunned silence for a few seconds. Her eyes widened as she realized she hadn't paid much attention to Ezekiel's appearance at the airport and wasn't in the mood to scrutinize the video closely. As a result, she wasn't expecting the man to look so breathtakingly handsome in person. Reuben was also stunned. He assumed that her benefactor would be an elderly or a wealthy but average-looking person. Still, he never expected him to be a handsome young man with an impressive physique. You're here. Ezekiel smiled. She blinked, feeling a sudden urge to retaliate even more against Reuben. Ignoring her pride, she impulsively pressed Ezekiel against the door frame. Her slender hand circled his neck as she stood on her tiptoes. Then, she directed her soft, 
red lips toward his sexy, thin ones and kissed him. Harmony's soft lips, carrying a hint of sweet fragrance, left an imprint on Ezekiel's slightly cool mouth. He also tensed up. His mind went blank for a few seconds, like someone overwhelmed by a forced kiss. Harmony, how could you? I thought I betrayed you and still felt guilty about it, but I never expected that you had already hooked up with someone else. Shame on you. Reuben completely lost his composure, pointing at her and cursing. To him, she was the betrayer. She had hooked up with a handsome and wealthy man. Right then, he felt jealousy and anger surged within him. After Harmony let go of the man she had just kissed without consent, she turned to Reuben. You're right. I've dealt with SC asterisk M bags like you. You're not the only one who knows how to charm those social superiors. There are guys interested in me too, you know. Listening to their conversation, Ezekiel finally grasped the reason behind the teary eyes he had seen at the airport. It seemed like her boyfriend had betrayed her. Besides that, she had used him to retaliate against the SC asterisk MBAG. Since she forced him to play along with her, he could try to play the part. After all, he hadn't gotten enough of the kiss just now. Ezekiel suddenly wrapped his hand around Harmony's waist and pulled her closer. Following that, he held the back of her head, which was the same posture as before, and kissed her red lips. At the same time, he swept his gaze provocatively toward Reuben in the corridor. Watching the scene unfold, Reuben felt a pang in his heart. He had hoped to leave Catalina and rekindle things with Harmony once he made a name for himself in the entertainment industry. But now, it was clear that Harmony wasn't the innocent girl he thought she was, as she had already fallen for someone else. He cursed under his breath, damn it. Very well, Harmony. Reuben gritted his teeth and cursed before storming away. Once he turned the corner, Harmony pushed the man away while panting slightly. Something had gone awry. This wasn't the story she had envisioned. How on earth did she end up kissing the guy? Ezekiel led her into his room and closed the door with a bang. The next moment, she had her back against the wall while the man stood before her with his arms crossed. His slender fingers brushed over his sexy, thin lips as he questioned, you're the first woman who dared to take advantage of me. Feeling a bit uneasy about her unintentional offense, she quickly apologized, I'm sorry, sir. Please accept my apology. I came here to retrieve the gemstone you found. Ezekiel squinted his eyes and sized Harmony up. While he didn't get to see her appearance at the airport, she was now standing openly under the light. She had an almost flawless and beautiful face, a pair of bright eyes, and a pair of inviting lips. Also, she had a graceful yet shapely figure. It seemed like the woman was perfectly aligned with his preferences, which was rare. She felt his scrutinizing gaze and felt her scalp tingling. While biting her red lips, she asked, May I ask if you would be willing to return that gemstone to me? Yes, the gemstone is indeed with me. After Ezekiel finished speaking, he turned toward the couch and beckoned her. Come over here, and let's properly discuss how to settle this matter. Harmony's beautiful eyes widened slightly, thinking, What does he mean by that? Will he not return it until I make some kind of payment? Don't tell me he wants. She swallowed nervously. Even though she had offended him earlier, the thought of offering herself hadn't crossed her mind. Looking around the luxurious room, she cautiously approached the couch. She looked at the man sitting there elegantly with his long, slender legs crossed together and breathed out slightly. Sir, what will it take for you to return the gemstone to me? Though Ezekiel had yet to decide what he wanted from Harmony, he did feel somewhat bored, so he took another wine glass from the rack and poured two glasses of red wine. Why don't you have a drink with me first? That made her feel even more nervous. She pondered, what does he want? Is he trying to get me drunk? I have low alcohol tolerance, sir. So, please go easy on me, Harmony said as she waved her hand. It's just half glass. You won't get drunk, Ezekiel replied, only wanting someone to share a drink with. His gaze landed on the woman on the couch, and he recalled the situation at the airport, so he asked, are you a celebrity? She corrected, no, I'm just an ordinary actress. My job is acting in films. He responded with a casual, oh. 
Following that, she glanced at the half-full glass of wine and quickly inquired, So, does this mean I get the gemstone back if I finish this? Ezekiel smirked, yes. Hearing that, Harmony immediately picked up the glass and downed it in two gulps. Afterward, she wiped her lips and remarked, I'm done. His eyes widened slightly, wondering, does she know the wine she drank so casually cost 63,000 per bottle? She didn't even savor it properly. What a waste. However, she saw his expression and thought she hadn't drunk enough, so she quickly picked up the bottle of red wine and poured herself another glass. If you're not satisfied, I can have another one. In her eyes, the man was only trying to tease her a little before giving her what she wanted, and if that were the case, she would appease him herself. Therefore, Harmony tilted her head back and finished her red wine. She let out a hiccup and asked with blushing cheeks, Can you return the gem to me now? Ezekiel was stunned for a moment, then couldn't help but chuckle. Pulling out a drawer, he grabbed the gem and placed it on the table. Sure, here. Harmony grabbed the gem and heaved a sigh of relief. She even kissed the gem before getting up and thanking the man. Thank you, I won't bother you any longer. Once she finished speaking, she approached the door with hurried steps, about to leave. Hey, Ezekiel couldn't help but call out to her. Although she heard him, she didn't stop. Instead, she pulled the door open and left. Ezekiel stood up, his figure resembling a prince as he stood under the lights. However, a man like him couldn't get this young lady to stay. If it had been another woman, she wouldn't have wanted to leave. When Harmony entered the elevator, her whole body relaxed, and she leaned against the elevator wall. Only then did she think about the feeling of being kissed just now, and her cheeks began to heat up. Oh my gosh, I kissed him. Meanwhile, Sarah was waiting downstairs. When she saw Harmony approaching, she immediately went over. My dear Miss Mayo, did you get the gem? Harmony nodded and then took out the gem to show Sarah, who also patted her chest and shouted, Hallelujah. With a stern expression, she added, I'll contact the jewelry provider immediately and get them to restore it. After that, you head back immediately to film the advertisement. Knowing she was reckless to have run abroad for a man who was unworthy of her feelings and almost lost a gem worth 15 million, Harmony nodded. Okay. I'll leave tonight. As for the incident where she kissed the man upstairs, she chose not to say a word. By the way, did you meet that man? Did he say whether he was willing to become a celebrity under our label? Sarah hadn't forgotten about that matter. Finding it funny, Harmony replied, Sarah, look around and see which hotel you're at. It costs over 60000 to book one night's stay here. Do you think a man like that would lack money and want to become a celebrity? It was only then that Sarah realized that fact. You're right. He must not lack money. After thinking about it, Harmony realized that not only did the man not lack money, but he was even exuding a noble, glamorous, and opulent temperament. Besides that, his smile was also very charming. Did Reuben cause trouble for you just now? Nope, but I've already moved on. Harmony got the chance to retaliate harshly against Reuben. She felt grateful for the mysterious man who helped her get back at Reuben. Cheer up. There are plenty of men out there. Once you've established yourself in this industry, it would be easy for you to snag a rich young man, Sarah comforted Harmony. On the other hand, Ezekiel sat in the room, looking at the empty wine glass. His mind was filled with images of the young woman just now, including her bright and lovely appearance. It was as though her laugh could automatically make his day. Rubbing his temples, Ezekiel wondered, what's this? Why am I suddenly attracted to that lady? Forget it. It's just a coincidence, and I won't see her again. Flintstone residence. Shirley was looking at the guest list while Zacharias had become even more swamped. That was because he not only had to work, but he also had to prepare for their upcoming wedding. Compared to him, all Shirley had to do was continue with her days and await the day she would become his bride. When she was about to fall asleep, she heard the sound of a car from outside and instantly woke up. She approached the French windows and saw the man's convoy. At that point, she was no longer drowsy and ran downstairs to greet him. The car's door opened, and Zacharias, handsome and charming figure appeared. In his hand was a bouquet of fresh flowers and a bag. 
Just as he pushed the door open, he immediately saw the pajama-clad young woman coming to greet him. It's already so late, but you still brought flowers. Shirley accepted the flowers with a smile, feeling happy inside. Once she took the flowers, Zacharias wrapped his arm around her waist and kissed her forehead, I'm sorry that I came home late again. Shirley raised her head to reply, it's okay. I can wait for you. Zacharias brought her to the couch and took out a set of jewelry from the bag. These are for you. Why did you buy these? Stop spending so much money on me. Though Shirley said that, she still smiled and happily opened the box, revealing a three-piece set of beautifully designed jewelry that shimmered under the light. Do you like it? Zacharias asked. He had personally gone out to choose these. Nodding, Shirley replied, I do, but stop giving me presents like these. However, Zacharias wouldn't listen. Instead, he would give her these gifts every year. It's getting late. Let's head upstairs. Shirley held his hand. It was nearing dawn, and the man had plenty of things to do the next day, so she had to get him to rest earlier. Meanwhile, Zacharias noticed how eager she was and misunderstood her intentions. He let her lead him upstairs, and once they got to their bedroom, he immediately pushed her against the door. It seems like you miss me a lot. When Shirley raised her head and noticed the glint in his eyes, she couldn't help but chuckle. What are you thinking about? I just want you to rest earlier, not. The man cut off the rest of her words. Even though she denied it, her body was honest. Damn it. I admit that I want it, too. Even though they had a tight schedule to prepare for a royal wedding, that didn't stop everything from progressing in an organized manner. During the next half a month, Shirley had only one task preparing herself to become a beautiful bride. She had high-end personalized wedding gowns and evening dresses, jewelry she could pick from, and best wishes from all parties. Besides that, Angela even hired professionals to educate her daughter so that she would become a very elegant lady at the wedding. That was because Shirley grew up in a graceless environment, and Angela didn't expect her daughter to marry the vice president. Therefore, Shirley must start attending etiquette lessons. During the two-hour course, Shirley spaced out for nearly an hour because the etiquette teacher's tone was like a lullaby, almost lulling her to sleep several times. In addition, Zacharias didn't let her sleep well last night. That man seemed to have abnormally high stamina, which even she admired. Not only could he focus on dealing with work matters and wedding preparations in the morning, but he could also work out until late at night. Therefore, Shirley just happened to have the urge to doze off during her afternoon etiquette class. In the end, after she managed to force herself to finish her etiquette class, she had to attend an art appreciation course that her mother arranged for her as well. It felt like her mother saw her as a student about to take a college entrance exam and arranged whatever she saw fit into every second of her daughter's free time. While inside the car, Shirley couldn't stop herself from complaining to her man, but the man was also helpless in this situation. After all, that was his mother-in-law's arrangement, and it was inappropriate for him to interfere. Therefore, he could only comfort Shirley, telling her to escape every chance she got and leave his mother-in-law to him. Hearing that, Shirley cracked up. It seemed like the man had played truant quite often back in the day. Halfway through her art class, Shirley heard her phone ring. When she glanced at it, she almost screamed because her savior had arrived. It was a call from Willow. Miss, excuse me, but I would like to take a leave of absence. I have something very urgent to attend to, Shirley requested politely. The teacher deduced from Shirley's expression that this matter might be very urgent, so she nodded. Go ahead, Miss Lloyd. Once Shirley was outside, she quickly answered the call, Hey, Willow. Have you arrived? On my way. I'll wait for you. Willow's gentle voice came from the phone. The two had agreed to have afternoon tea together. After all, Willow had returned to the country ahead of schedule just to meet up with Shirley before the latter's wedding and have a girl's talk. At the cafe, Willow wore sweet, elegant attire. Her naturally elegant temperament was certainly not something that could be brought by clothing and makeup but something she was born with. When Shirley sat down and saw the aromatic coffee on the table, she picked it up and took a sip. I've been so exhausted for the last few days. My mom is afraid I'll embarrass her at my wedding, so she has arranged various courses for me. 
I can't help but wonder, am I that graceless? Willow chuckled. Maybe Mrs. Lloyd wants you to become more mature and elegant. Shirley smiled. I know, so I comply. Have you set a date for your wedding? It's all set in May, and it will be held on an island. I never thought I'd get married before you. Shirley remembered when they met at the base, she was still a novice in relationships. I never thought you'd become the vice president's wife. But this status suits you. You exude a remarkable grace that can handle any occasion. Willow praised her. Shirley felt a bit embarrassed by the compliments and said humbly, don't keep praising me. I might get carried away. Willow genuinely admired Shirley's demeanor. The two moved on to discuss dresses. In this regard, Shirley often sought advice from Willow as she considered Willow to have an excellent sense of fashion, which was also a fact. So, they discussed wedding dress styles and colors. A delightful afternoon unfolded, and the two chatted until it was dusk. However, they didn't plan to have dinner together that night due to prior commitments. As they laughed and exited the restaurant, two men who had been sitting there for a while noticed them and decided to introduce themselves. Ladies, can we get to know each other? The two men directly blocked their path. Shirley smiled faintly. Sorry, it's not convenient. Miss, please, just leave a phone number. Maybe we can grab coffee sometime and be friends. We're not bad people. These men thought highly of themselves and tried their luck with the pretty girls they saw. Unbeknownst to them, two tall bodyguards approached from the entrance. We said it's not convenient. Please step aside, Willow said in a cold tone. The men were reluctant to give up. They perceived these women as being of high status and were audacious enough to try and get acquainted. Miss, one of the men was about to speak again when suddenly, their arms were roughly grabbed, and they were pulled a few steps away. When they turned around, they were dumbfounded. How did four tall and burly bodyguards suddenly appear behind them? Are you two okay, Miss Presgrave? The bodyguards asked with concern. We're fine, Willow replied while taking Shirley's hand and walking away. The two men gawked as they watched the bodyguards escort the women and realized they weren't qualified to get to know them. Moreover, they noticed a row of bodyguards outside the restaurant's door disappearing as the women left. In an instant, the two men were drenched in cold sweat. Just what kind of background did these women have? After parting ways, Shirley received a call from Zacharias, who asked her to wait for him at the White House. He was in a meeting and would like to return home with her in the evening. Shirley had the bodyguards escort her to the White House. After strict inspections, her car stopped at the entrance. Shirley got out of the car. She was ready to go inside and wait for a while. Suddenly, she heard a car pulling into the adjacent parking spot. She couldn't help but look up, and when she saw a familiar figure, she froze for a few seconds. It was Cole. She was incredibly surprised. Was Cole working here again? Cole also spotted her and exclaimed, Surely, it's really you. He hadn't expected to see her here either. Cole, what a coincidence. Shirley greeted him with a smile. It's been a while. I heard you're getting married. Congratulations, Cole said with a composed demeanor. As a former special agent, his actions were as sharp and concise as his personality. Thank you. Are you working here again? Shirley asked. I'm just here for a meeting, I'll leave in three days, he replied. He had come to accept a mission. Shirley smiled. She had once harbored feelings for Cole. It was a naive fondness, but now she realized time had transformed those emotions into friendship. She was not coy. She faced everything straightforwardly. Even when encountering Cole, she hoped for a sincere conversation and greeting. At the entrance of the White House, a figure in a suit descended slowly. His pupils slightly widened for a few seconds when he saw the pair chatting in the parking lot. Why was Cole here? And why was Shirley talking with him? The only man who could make Zacharias jealous was probably Cole. Cole was pressed for time. After glancing at his watch, he said to Shirley, Shirley, congratulations again. I wish you happiness. Shirley pursed her lips and accepted his wishes. Thank you. I wish you success in your work as well. As Cole turned away, he felt a strong sense of oppression emanating from the man nearby instantly. His heart tightened slightly as he went to greet Zacharias. Mr. Flintstone. Hello. Zacharias smiled and nodded gracefully. 
Cole nodded back and then headed toward the entrance of the White House. Shirley just realized Zacharias was there. Her gaze met his, and as he approached, she noticed that he seemed a bit jealous as he narrowed his eyes. She reached out and embraced his waist. Are you jealous? Zacharias was restraining himself. He held her waist firmly and insisted, not at all. I know that. You love me, Shirley chuckled. Um, being able to look at things from a different perspective is a good habit. Of course, I've always been someone who looks at things from a third-party perspective, Zacharias said. It was his approach that made him calm and rational. Although he claimed not to be jealous, his hand on her waist proved otherwise. When the bodyguards approached to open the car door, he said, enter in ten minutes. The bodyguard understood immediately. Shirley widened her beautiful eyes as she was pushed into the car by the man. She had underestimated his jealousy. As soon as the man got into the car, he leaned in for a kiss, as if he was trying to claim something. She was left feeling weak in his arms, and it took her a while to regain her senses. It seemed that Zachariah's jealousy was indeed substantial. After the kiss, Zacharias didn't seem to be that jealous anymore. Resting his forehead against hers, he gave her another peck on the lips and said, let's go home. Throughout the journey, Shirley felt embarrassed and pretended to sleep in his embrace. The bodyguard was well aware of what had happened in the car. Back at the Flintstone residence, he carried her bag while she walked in casually. Then, he hung up her bag and his suit. I've asked the housekeeper not to come tonight. We'll make dinner ourselves. Shirley agreed. Sounds good. Sometimes, enjoying each other's company in their own world was more comfortable than being served by others. Why did Cole come? Zacharias couldn't help but ask. He seems to be here to accept a mission, but I didn't ask for specifics, Shirley replied before reaching out to hug his neck. Mr. Flintstone, you're not still jealous, are you? What do you think? He countered while recalling how this girl had once pursued Cole. It made him feel uneasy. Shirley smiled and coaxed him. What should I do so you won't be jealous then? You'll be on top tonight, Zacharias stated his demand. She huffed in annoyance while pounding his chest lightly. You're so annoying. He held her hand while looking at her charmingly irritated expression. He pulled her closer before planting a kiss. Consider it a way to coax me. But I'm hungry. Shirley blushed slightly. All right. I'll cook for you right away. Wait for me. Zacharias chuckled and kissed her forehead before rolling up his sleeves and heading to the kitchen. Shirley watched his sturdy and tall figure and felt a surge of sweet happiness in her heart. Perhaps this was the attraction and appreciation they held for each other. Inside the presidential suite of the Manson Hotel, Ezekiel had just finished a video conference. He reached for a bottle of red wine, and his thoughts drifted to the girl from last night when he saw the bottle. If he recalled correctly, the man from last night had called her Harmony Mayo. He poured himself a glass of wine. His life revolved around work and indulgence. It was simple yet structured. He picked up his tablet and casually entered the name, Harmony Mayo, in the search bar. The search engine immediately suggested a name Harmony Mayo. Due to Harmony's current popularity as an artist, her name was the first recommendation in the search bar. Ezekiel clicked on the name and soon found numerous photos of her, along with a brief biography. He finished reading her profile with interest and then noticed her latest movie. He picked up the remote control and used voice search to find her film. An Asian spy film appeared. Ezekiel wasn't a movie person, anything created by others lacked appeal to him. Moreover, he owned an international film and television production company, his interest lay in investment and not appreciation. His slender fingers were propped against his chin, and his gaze was fixed on the screen. The girl who appeared in the first shot was graceful and alluring in the dim light. Her hips were swaying, and there was a smile on her lips. Her radiance captivated his heart instantly. He hadn't expected her to be young yet with such decent acting skills. She portrayed the demeanor of a 17 or 18 year old girl from Asia so perfectly. Ezekiel continued to watch the movie. When he saw a scene where a lecherous old man was leering at her, his pupils involuntarily narrowed. It felt like he was suddenly immersed in the film. He was genuinely worried that something might happen to this girl. 
This was Harmony's new movie, where she played a secret agent. Her acting skills were exceptional, and she captivated the hearts of her fans with every expression. Additionally, there were many beautiful scenes featuring her, making the movie a hit and her even more popular. Whenever the names of emerging young actresses were mentioned, Harmony's name and scenes were always highlighted. It won her a large number of both male and female fans. Ezekiel bit his thin lips while continuing to watch. He had been sipping wine while watching the movie for an hour and a half, unknowingly. He was genuinely impressed with her performance in the movie and her natural yet skilled acting. Harmony Mayo, he murmured her name. She had seemingly sparked even more interest within him. Little did anyone know, the newly famous Harmony was about to face a sudden twist in her love life. At this moment, she was touching a repaired gemstone necklace that was around her neck and was preparing to shoot an advertisement. She was unaware that the gemstone in her hand would lead her life in a different direction. On Christmas Eve, the media solemnly announced a piece of happy news Zachariah's wedding. Congratulatory words poured in from the entire media network. However, the details of the wedding were shrouded in secrecy. Even though some media outlets had gathered information about the wedding venue, they dared not disclose it. The wedding ceremony at the Royal Hotel was grand and romantic. Zacharias wore a white suit today, a departure from the usual black attire he wore. He exuded exceptional handsomeness while emitting an air of happiness throughout the event. Shirley, who was clad in a white wedding gown, held her beloved's hand and took each step toward the sacred halls of marriage. Below the stage, there were congratulations and well wishes from various attendees. Two unwavering, I do's, resonated before drawing applause from the audience. Upon seeing them embrace each other, both their parents could deeply feel and empathize with the love between the couple. Shirley didn't disappoint her mother. She stood by Zacharias, sighed with elegance and grace while exuding an aura that was no less impressive. As they stood together on the stage with their hands clasped, they were equals in status and united in soul. Thanks for watching. Like and subscribe for more videos.